In the geospatial industry, our mission is understanding the location of everything. But location isn't just about the places. It's also about the journey. The journey of how we got here. The journey of people who strive to make a difference. The journey of understanding our world through the eyes of innovation. At Project Geospatial, our stories are about the journey of where. Come check us out at www.projectgeospatial.com. Um, my name is Maggie Colley. I serve as the executive director for OpenStreetMap US. Um, and I had the pleasure of co-chairing this year's Fedgeo Day alongside Eddie Pickle. Um, and it's been a, a long trek to get here, but we're, we're happy to be here today with all of you. So thanks for showing up. Also want to thank our sponsor, Kerasoft. Um, thank you, Kerasoft. Woo -woo. Next year, I want to see a lot more company names up here, though, by the way. <laughs> so think ahead. Um, also, some partners this year, uh, OSGO US. I don't know if Gita's in the room. Thanks for all your hard work. Um, and then the team at OpenStreetMap US was hard at work this year helping alongside um, the team. Also want to thank everybody who joined our many meetings over the past six months. Um, can all of the members of the planning committee that are here in person please stand up? We never really met each other in person, so. All right. Great. We'll all have to get together later. <laughs> Quite a few people came together to make this a possibility, which I think embodies what the open source community does. Um, so this is the 10th Fed Geo Day. Uh, it was initiated in 2012. How many people were at that first event? Wow. <laughs> Thank you for admitting that and welcome back. <laughs> My first Fed Geo Day was actually in 2013, uh, which I, I didn't realize. I looked back at a blog that I started 10 years ago, Maggie Maps, and it was my first entry, was my big trip to DC to go to Fed Geo Day 2013. And for me, it launched me into an entirely new path for my life. So I, I kind of have a special place in my heart for this event. So how many people are here for the first time? That's fantastic. Welcome. Um, so the, the the idea behind FedGeo Day is it's dedicated to promoting the use of open geospatial e ecosystems to build programs um, in the U.S. federal agencies and their partners. So really pushing open into all of the things that drive uh, our day-to-day -day lives through our federal agencies, um, and that's why we're all here. A lot of what it has, has done for me is build those relationships to be able to change the way things work and open up our systems and programs. Um, one example I, I will give a plug today is OpenStreetMap US is launching a statewide initiative, a national initiative really, to map all of the trails in Utah starting today um, alongside state, federal, local partners. <laughs> And a lot of those relationships that led to that launch over the last two years have, have really led to, to being able to do something like this across, across the country. Um, so please meet people, talk about what you're into, and hopefully you'll walk away from today with a lot of new relationships and ideas for how to use open in your programs. The board will leave it out again. All right, this was the best slide. So, <laughs> So this slide tells you about open geospatial ecosystems. Um, a lot of people ask, what does that even mean? What, do, what are we doing here? What's an open geospatial ecosystem? Um, and I think there's quite a few we can, we can name. Uh, we have the free and open source software, the FOSFRG. Who's here for that? <laughs> uh, we have QGIS, GeoNode, GeoServer, PostGIS, a lot of the folks doing their workshops today too. There's the open collaborative mapping communities. So a couple of our panelists are going to talk about you know, VGI today and, and open source and open data. Um, NGA GNOME, USGS National Map Corps, and of course OpenStreetMap. Um, open innovation programs and applications. You know, we have Census Open Innovation Lab. Anybody here from there today? Um, OGC innovation pilots, uh, quite a few things going on in that space. And then, you know, open geospatial science. Here's to, this is the year of open science, right? So um, 
the LandScan, SpaceNet, Conflict Observatory, uh, just to name a few. So those are some of the things we'll hear about today. We've got a great program and a lot of panelists. How many people in the room are going to be participating in the program today? Quite a few folks. Um, so it's a great day, and we're going to kick things off here with our keynote. Uh, I'd like to invite Josh Delmonico to the stage. Um, Josh serves as the executive director for the Federal Geographic Data Committee, FGDC, for those of you in the know. Um, in this role, he provides executive leadership for the coordination of U.S. federal geospatial activities in collaboration with the 32, 32? 32. 32 FGDC member federal agencies uh, to implement the Geospatial Data Act and conduct strategic planning and visioning for the implementation of national spatial data infrastructure, NSDI, which we are all a part of across the nation. So help me welcome Josh to the stage. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for, for the opportunity. Super excited uh, to be here and be a part of this, this community. As Maggie said, it's a year of open data and open, open science. We have a lot of uh, amazing things happening in, in the federal space and in the commercial and, and in the nation due to the work that, that you guys do. You know, some of the awesome work happening at OpenStreetMap with open software, all of the, the data collection and opportunities out there. I think it's, can you guys hear me okay? I'm not sure if the microphone's, all right. Uh, anyway, all, all of the work that's that's happening is, is, is really incredible and shaping the, the industry and technology and, and really the way we're moving forward in, in the world. So today I have, let's see, the opportunity, sorry. to figure out how to use PowerPoint in front of all of you. There we go. Whoops. There we go. All right, so uh, anyway, today I'm gonna to talk about a little bit about the National Spatial Data Infrastructure. I'm gonna to touch a little bit on what, what I've been working on in my role leading that effort forward uh, for the nation and then talk about some of the challenges and some of the places that I think, you know, the. Uh, open source community can can help contribute in in this space and certainly I don't have all the answers so would welcome your thoughts and and uh, ideas on how you can help forward where we're trying to go so uh, I thought it'd be useful to start out with the definition of the national spatial data infra infrastructure so what what is the National Spatial Data Infrastructure. The Geospatial Data Act defines it as the technology policies, criteria, standards, and employees really to promote data sharing across uh, the nation. And it's not just data sharing for data sharing's sake, but really when you look at this slide, the left-hand side is, is kind of how we've organized our, our federal data, but it's federal, state, tribal, and, and local data, as well as nonprofit, academia, and private sector data made available through a, a national spatial data infrastructure to address our national prop. I don't know why you're seeing that slide. Interesting. I really do know how to use PowerPoint, but we'll try again this way. There we go. All right. There we go. Now my dialogue might match my slides. But you guys saw this slide, right? Okay. No? Oh, good. All right. Well, just try to remember what I said a minute ago about the National Spatial Data Infrastructure. <laughs> Promoting data sharing, but not just data sharing for data sharing's sake. But if you look at the right-hand side of the slide, it's really taking our nation's geospatial uh, resources, our capabilities, our data, our systems, and our applications, and making them available to address the, the really existential problems we face, not just as a nation, but as a globe. So things like you know, food security, climate, immigration, infrastructure management. You know, how, how do we put our best foot forward as a geospatial community and, and enable the rest of the nation to, to access this data to help solve some of those problems. Well, let's see. So where, where are we today in this? Oh, that's interesting. All right, I'm waiting. All right. The laptop's disconnected from what's happening on the screen, or at least in my mind it is, so I can see one slide, but it does, anyway. Not that you needed to know that. So, so where we are today is sort of this mix. Maggie mentioned this, this ecosystem. So one way to think about the, the world today is that there are these 
these ecosystems of geospatial capabilities and data. Some of them are at a, at a state level, you call them spatial data infrastructures where states and counties and cities are, are connected. Sometimes multiple states are connected in, in regions. We have these topical ecosystems like a marine spatial data infrastructure where data around a particular topic is flowing across multiple organizations and there's capabilities and tools and analytics available. On the left-hand side of the slide, we have national data sets that, that the federal government and other organizations are have built and made available across the nation. There are a lot of different catalog capabilities, uh, visualization analytics services, and, and a lot of emerging technology. Much of the most exciting stuff happening now is things in the space of artificial intelligence, 3D, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, and, and some of you know those things. But they're enabled on a framework of standards and, and metadata. So, let's see if I can. So really, where are we gonna go from here? And I think we have an opportunity to really ask ourselves, you know, how, how do we deliver? All right, sorry. Oh, man. I'm, get, I'm so close to having this figured out. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, how do we deliver data and insight? You know, it isn't really useful to drop a bunch of, sorry, knowledge and insight. It isn't really useful to drop a bunch of data on a person trying to make a decision. They really want help giving them that answer. And I, I've heard this idea of data to knowledge to insight, and I've kind of wondered, what does that look like in practice? So I did my own uh, analogy here. But you know, if, if you took a few screen captures from, from my phone, or if you look at the lower left, you have data and information, right? Like where's Washington DC? What are the main roads around? What's that kind of general traffic stuff? But that's not really useful. You know, nobody can do much with that information. And then when, when you get to the kind of the knowledge piece, I start to understand, well, here's kind of what I have to do to get from you know, point A to point B, here's about the time it's gonna take me, and here's some alternate routes. But there's really not a decision exactly to be made until you deliver insights. And I think turn by turn directions and, and recommendations on where, where we go is really an example of what delivering an insight instead of just you know, delivering a bunch of data to somebody on their phone, they don't really know what to do with that. They wanna know where am I supposed to turn and, and how am I gonna get there? So I think it's incumbent upon us to think about how, how are we gonna make our data and information more accessible and more available to the other 99% of the world that doesn't do this for a living, who can really benefit from access to, to our data inf and information, but not as raw data, but, but what are those insights that they, they can uh, derive value from? All right, so how are we gonna get there? And this will be like, man, he got us all excited and now he's gonna tell us we're gonna get there with a plan. But we're gonna get there with a strategic plan and, and really the idea is there we can't know where we're all gonna try to go together. So when I say all, we're really thinking of our national spatial data infrastructure. So it's a, a pretty wide, well, it's the entire nation, right? A, a huge stakeholder community with a lot of disparate interests, capabilities, and, and direction. So a plan gives us the left and right limits and an idea of where we're all trying to go together so that we can get there from our own sort of uh, perspective and area of responsibility. So this is our draft plan. Uh, I've been working with the Census Bureau and uh, myself or Deirdre Bishop are co-championing the development of the strategic plan. and. Talked to about 800 people to date to get uh, this plan developed, and we'll be working this over about the next six months to finalize it next summer. So, I'd welcome your, you know, thoughts and and feedback on this as we go through that uh, process. And then once we hold on, all right. Once we get there, I th sorry, is that the right one? Yeah. All right, I'm with you. Sorry this is clunky, but it's hard to go back and forth. I also think once we have a plan, we need an implementation plan, right? How are we gonna actually implement that strategy? And this is just some some ideas and thoughts. I think, you know, some of these phases might be concurrent, not all, ha like data development, for example, we're probably never gonna stop developing that data or maintaining data that we have. I think we might use some tools like artificial intelligence or get better at doing that, but data development's gonna, going to continue. I think working to make our data more discoverable, you know, how, how do you access 
and search the National Spatial Data Infrastructure, I'm not entirely sure, but I think we could do better at, at sort of maturing those, those national search capabilities. Making our data and metadata uh, machine readable is, is a really important, I think, step in that process and, and integrating advanced technologies and really pushing towards a geospatial ecosystem uh, that Maggie talked a little bit about. So let's see. I am so mean. All right. So on the, you know, I said I was going to talk for a second about the the challenges, and I think this is where, you know, we all collectively need to put our heads together and think about how we're going to go about this and and how we can kind of change the way the entire industry functions. So I've been thinking a lot about, you know, we we got where we are by doing what we've been doing, and and I think we really have to think very hard about where we've been and how we think about our our work and ask ourselves are we doing things you know in, in the best way and I'll just use an example to, to maybe add a little clarity to this so from my perspective right I, I started doing GIS in the mid 90s it was command line arc info you'd go up to a folder on a computer or server grab some files bring them down put them together and make a map right and I think that 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 simple perspective shapes the way I think about GIS even today I still have this idea like I want to go get the data and I got to like have it here and I got to put all this stuff together and then I think there's a whole generation of people that don't think like that and and I think fundamentally asking ourselves what can we do different and and how do we really take advantage of the tools and capabilities we have to deliver the best we can is is incumbent upon all of us so some of the challenges i think you know how, how do we lower the barriers to getting our geospatial data and applications out and really delivering data and knowledge uh, supporting that 99 percent that aren't geospatial professionals you know and i think about my mom, I think about her phone and she uses it just to do map directions. That's the only thing she uses geospatial for and she doesn't even know it's geospatial really. So what are those other examples? What are other things and other tools we can give to people that become part of their everyday life? Artificial intelligence provides us, uh, I mean, I don't have to tell you guys this, an incredible opportunity for, for technology, not just in, you know, geospatial artificial intelligence, how we're doing our uh, geospatial things like data development, but you know, maybe even we can ask artificial intelligence or do work with artificial intelligence to help us find what's the best available data, help us do search better, integrate artificial intelligence with things like, or sorry, geospatial data with things like chat GPT. So we're asking geospatial questions, but not getting a map as a response. It's just getting factored into a textual response. I think all of these things are, are places that we can, you know, look, how about a, I don't, how about a large language model that's open source for geospatial? Uh, you're gonna hear a lot of great talks about some of these things, you know, this question of authoritative versus fit for purpose versus best available. You know, can we crowdsource whether a data set's the best data? Uh, and then integrating uh, 3D augmented reality and, and virtual reality, kind of getting into some of the, the capabilities there. Uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunity in this community to continue to, to lead and provide, you know, different ways of thinking and different ways of looking at the world really to help us solve the nation's uh, biggest challenges. So uh, thanks very much. I appreciate your time and for hanging with me while I deal with the screen. Okay, before we go to our final panel uh, on uh, 
authoritative data and AI, or AI and authoritative data. I want to introduce two people very important to our program today. One, I want to thank uh, Maggie Colley, who has, who is, of course, the executive director of OpenStreetMap US, um, and she's going to be moderating the panel. And I uh, really appreciate her, all her help and the support that the OSM US uh, group does for this organization. And if you are not familiar with um, OpenStreetMap, there are a number of um, there's at least a couple of different panels in the or presentations in the um, uh, Foster G pro program the next couple of days. Uh, Maggie mentioned the Trails Initiative that's just starting out. This is a huge deal. Uh, in collaboration between the federal government and OpenStreetMap for volunteers for geospatial information. It's almost like unbelievable to me after years and years. The other thing, I also wanted to introduce Dr. Carter Christopher. Carter is on the panel, but he organized this, and I really appreciate his up. Uh, Carter is, of course, at ORNL, where he's the section head for o Human Dynamics uh, in the National Laboratories um, Geospatial Science and Human Security Division. Many of you knew Carter when he worked at NGA. Uh, he, some of you knew Carter when he worked for um, the State Department and under the geographer of the United States, but I really appreciate his help in organizing this panel. Carter, thank you. So, Maggie, take it away. Yeah, here's your uh, first. Thank you, Eddie. Welcome back. Uh, we are the last panel of the day, so hang in there. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've heard a lot about what we're, a lot of the panels already touched on what we're going to dive into a little bit more deeply now, um, talking about, you know, that that magic word authoritativeness, um, especially now in the age of Aquarius, of AI um, and VGI. Sorry, it's late. I have to make some jokes to keep you engaged. Um, so thank you, Eddie, for already introducing me and Carter, but I'll, I'll pass it down and, and have Mike and Will introduce themselves. Hi, I'm uh, Will Morrison. I'm the Deputy Director for the Office of Geography at NGA. Been in that job for roughly seven months. Uh, prior to that, I was over at CBP for a year. Um, and then before that, I was the VGI lead for NGA for about eight years. I stood up a program called GNOME, which some folks have talked about today. So I will hand it to Mike. Afternoon. I'm the director of the National Geospatial Program at the U.S. Geological Survey. We're the, the lead domestic agency for topographic mapping in the United States. We've got active programs in national LIDAR acquisition, production of surface water mapping, the national hydrography data sets, and then the operational production of topographic maps. Uh, we have a, a dynamic mapping system. You can come in and check out Topo Builder. You can get a make your own map. It takes about eight to ten minutes at best. And then we also have the stage maps that we've been producing for, I don't know, 150 years or so. Great. Well, welcome. Uh, we have three or four questions for the panelists that they'll talk through, but we want to make sure that we leave time at the end for y'all's questions. So think about what you want to ask us already, um, and don't be shy. So we're going to start down there at the end with Will, um, and we're going to just ask that main question. I, have, I don't know if Ron's still here, but thank you for defining authoritativeness for us earlier. But I'm, I'm going to ask each of these panelists, how does your agency or, or where, you, where you serve define or view authoritativeness for data? So that's a good question. Um, I was sort of joking with Maggie before we walked up here when a tough question comes out. You know, when they ask a question, you ask a question back. So what do you define as authoritative data? So, and I say that sort of tongue in cheek in the fact that what I believe is authoritative may not necessarily believe be what Eddie believes is authoritative. The real key is, does it meet my mission need? And can I use utilize that data to accomplish an objective? Uh, we do produce authoritative data within our organization. And by authoritative, I would say our focus are analyzing data that we receive from different avenues and different venues. Um, so we feel confident in the data that we're choosing, but I've seen authoritative be wrong, right? Authoritative data be incorrect. And so I think it sort of goes back to the conversations we had about um, fit for use and sort of, you know, what's going to meet your mission needs. So by authoritative, I mean, that's the best definition I can give you from the Will Mortensen perspective. Um, I do know that we strive our best to produce the most authoritative data. But I'd say the key to that is having as much sources as possible. So I'm not just going to utilize OpenStreetMap, for example. I may use OpenStreetMap with seven or eight different sources to give me that more complex and authoritative uh, response to a question. 
Yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting question. If you backed up not that long ago, I think authoritative data, authoritative and official probably has similar definitions. Uh, I anticipated you might ask this question, and I referred to a really good source. The, the UN has a group called the Council of Experts on Global Geospatial Information Management. They have a subcommittee on legal and policy frameworks. Uh, if you can suffer through all that bureaucratic naming, there is a really important document they presented this August at the most recent UN GGIM meeting where they discuss just this very thing. What, is the, what does authoritative mean and uh, in light of fit for purpose data or official data? And they had a couple of definitions that they drew from other sources in the, in the, in the geospatial community around the globe. Uh, the UK Geospatial Commission adopts a definition that is very similar to official. It's an official government agency, and that's something that you see replicated in uh, your geographics definitions and even some ones that we probably use in the FGDC or other communities, where it's an agency that has the official designated authority or the legal authority authoritative data, legal authority, that kind of makes sense. There are some other definitions that look into an organization that has the mandate or the ability to maintain and serve that data so that it's not just dumped out there without any sustainable plan. Uh, I think it's, uh, there's also some elements in the definitions of your geographics that uh, the data is available to be in the public domain. It's not just authoritative and really good quality, but it's something that's, that's out there for public use and that can be reused. So I think it's a lot of these definitions. I think over the past couple of years, we've seen some more acceptance of data that doesn't have to come from an official designated government body be identified as authoritative, uh, and that there's more separation between official versus authoritative. But I think that definition is still evolving. So at, at Oak Ridge, we're a, um, Oak Ridge National Lab is a federally funded research and development organization. Um, what that means is we are uh, an, an element that is, can operate on behalf of the federal government and help the government solve hard problems. So we are consumers of authoritative data and we deliver things to the government that is then turned around as authoritative data sources. And so um, for us, what we consider to be authoritative is wholly rooted in fitness for use and trustworthiness. And we look at where can we find the best data available to support our science mission so that we can make the best science outcome, science data set that can then be used by the Department of Energy, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, or whomever our sponsor is to, um, to support their community, to support their customers. Uh, so when we think about trustworthiness, we think about reliability of the data, currency of the data, being able to quantify the uncertainty because all data has errors and all data has, has um, uh, as soon as data is created, it's immediately out of date. And uh, the world is constantly changing underneath of us. Uh, the things that are represented in the data may be static or stable for a certain period of time, but we want to understand the dynamism of the world that we're operating in so that we can quantify the uncertainty of the data that we're using and ultimately make um, as, as precise as possible science data sets that can be used by the government to, to answer questions. So when we think about authoritativeness of data, um, it's not just the source that it's coming from, but it's the trustworthiness of the source. Uh, Aaron Myers, who's, who's uh, on the Oak Ridge team uh, earlier today, talked about the Eagle Eye platform, and we source our outage data for Eagle Eye from the authoritative sources, which isn't the government, it's the utilities that report on the outages. But those utilities report their outages in uh, a, a plethora of different ways. Some of them have web pages that are updated all the time. Some of them tweet that out or, you know, whatever it's called now on X. Um, and, uh, and, and some of them don't report it in the same timely fashion as others. And so we have to uh, accommodate all of that in the ways that we aggregate and harmonize that data. Uh, so figuring out the right sources, but also the right ways to handle the data all flows into the authoritative uh, equation. I turned it off. <laughs> Thanks. Um, anybody have another comment on the authoritativeness theme before we move on? Great. Um, so thanks. There's are lots of characteristics come to mind for authoritative, but it seems like we still don't necessarily have a clear definition. <laughs> Keep working on that. Um, I'm going to start with, with you, Mike, next. I'm, I'm thinking about the responsibility, so not just the definition, but the responsibility involved in, in all data. Um, National App Corps is generating volunteer geographic information for the U.S. government, um, you know, and provides that 
data to the public. Um, is there any communication and what is the responsibility of government to provide the communication around those data sources and how it might be different from your other data sources? Uh, so I, I think it is a, a really imperative if we and, and our program is one where we aggregate data from a variety of different sources. If we include citizen science data or sources that we wouldn't traditionally use as, or see as authoritative and want to bring them into our, our data stack to produce on our maps or deliver out to the public, I think it is imperative that we communicate not only the source from where, from where we, we got the data, but what the error budget is, all the metadata about it, how reliable is it, if we're going to be stamping USGS on it. And, and the National Map Corps is one that we've been using for a number of years. For those that may not be familiar, there's a few thousand volunteers that we work with, and they augment our structures database, both the geometry and the attribution. It's a point data set, but we allow the users to come in and move the point so it's over the center point of a building. And they also can update a lot of the attribution so that the spelling is correct. Maybe you, you don't have any extraneous uh, upper lowercase, that it's uh, maybe if the spelling's changed or renamed, that's updated. So these are all the things the National Map Corps has done. And we've, I think we're still one of the very few, if the only, federal agencies that have a way to incorporate citizen science and VGI data into an authoritative product or an official product, depending on how you want to use the definition. Uh, but your question about how do we communicate this, uh, I, I looked into this a little bit in my own program because I wasn't quite so sure, and, and we do, and it's in metadata, which means that people probably aren't aware. <laughs> so I think there's some room for improvement there and how we communicate that, that people should be, I, I want to do a better job in, with not just National Map Corps data, but if we are going to be relaxing our definitions or looking to aggregate beyond our traditional definitions, what's a good mechanism to do that? Uh, sure, we can track it in the metadata and, and incorporate the provenance so people are aware, but do we have a higher responsibility to maybe highlight that or, or, or bring it up a, a level or maybe it's changing the symbology in the data to make it more aware that this was not necessarily the traditional source. Uh, it still goes through validation and in fact it meets all of our specifications for national map accuracy standards so it's not that it's poor data. In fact it turns out it's very high quality data. Uh, but I, I I do think we have not only a responsibility, and in some cases we're not maybe not meeting that responsibility and how we communicate that because I do think it is important. I'll pass it to, to Carter after this. I know you use a lot of, you know, AI generate data with, within your models, and is there any communication there with, within your products? So we, we definitely communicate data sources that we, that go into to our models. Um, I think the, uh, the most challenging thing when you start to think about and the reason that I organize this panel here for this this community, right, is is a lot, most of the AI work that's being done now is is being built on top of open source. Um, even the commercial AI platforms, it's all open source under the hood, right? Um, and and the the missing piece though is that we, we can talk about the model all day long, but these models don't do anything without training data, and we don't have a really good way of communicating the sources and provenance of the training data, which isn't just you know a source that you point to. Hey, I'm using Maxar imagery or Planet imagery, but it's tens of thousands of labeled la labeled here labels that go into these models, and how we have catalog document and report that out is a problem that we haven't haven't solved, that we haven't solved at this national lab and the community hasn't solved. Um, and when we start to get to that, that concept of trustworthiness, uh, I'm pointing at my paper because I've got it written down here, I'm reminding myself trustworthiness. Um, and you know, if you if you read the AI literature, you kind of read read the the industry rags, right? We we there's there's a lot of conversations around the trustworthiness of AI, especially in the, the you know the, in the uh, uh, hallucinations of ChatGPT, right? And and um, the same thing can be can can convey over to um, uh, the computer vision world, but. We have to have a way of documenting and understanding the provenance of the sources, of the label data that are coming into our models so that we can get to explainability, we can get to trustworthiness, and we can certainly understand the fitness for use of the AI outputs um, and ultimately, hopefully, get to some level of authoritativeness and, and trustworthiness for those, those sources. And we think, and we're very trusting of our own data, but we want the community to be as well. So I would just add on to Carter's point is that one of the things that I've only been in the seat I'm in for a very short period of time, but the training data is a big aspect of any AI ML activities. And I've, 
I'm constantly argued for some kind of training database of data, authoritative data, whether that be made through NGA or through other organizations that you have a trustworthy set of data that can go out and help train these algorithms because as he, as Carter referenced, it is, it is uh, time consuming, it is expensive, but I think the return on investment for the community be, would be huge, uh, a huge win for everyone. So that's one of the things I'd like to see. Um, whether or not we get there anytime soon is is hard to say. Um, and then I had a train of thought and then now it's just gone, but I'm sure it'll come back to me in a second. Mm, no. <laughs> Great. I mean, I, I think about licenses, actually, when you say that, because I think about, you know, OpenStreetMap is used often as label data. <laughs> it wasn't the license thing, but one of the things I do think would be nice is a sort of a government public partnership in that, you know, if the government's using open source of some type is if you're seeing errors, being able to report that back to the open source community, because I don't, I don't think that happens very much, if at all, but I do think it would be hugely beneficial if you're seeing stuff within the open source data sets that, hey, by the way, folks, this is, uh, this is what we're noticing, and it might help you guys make better data as well, so. Plus one to that. I mean, I know contributions to open source are always welcome, and I think that's one of the hardest things that we face as a community is bringing in more contributors. I mean, users are great, but contributions can be even better. Um, so plus one to that. So we're, we're cruising through these questions, but this makes we're going to have more time for, for audience. Um, I, I can take up a few seconds. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a good point you had about uh, a database of training data sets. We've talked a little bit about from the... I hate to use the word now, the authoritative data providers, or at least those ones that are part of the, the federal government portfolio, the National Spatial Data Infrastructure, and the ones that maintain a lot of the data sets, about we're, we're really good at producing nationally comprehensive, consistent data sets, whether it's elevation or addresses or hydrography or uh, all sorts of different things. You can look at the A16 portfolio and see that. Uh, we produce that out for a variety of products. There's nothing to say we couldn't create training data sets from those same elements, so that we have an elevation training data set of LiDAR point clouds or elevation models or surface water and hydrography that's very well described, that's very well maintained. That might be something as, as FTDC is going about their future NSDI strategy, uh, and we talk to the portfolio managers and theme leads that we think about, is there an opportunity for us to do that and contribute to the, to the world, or at least to the nation and their efforts in the federal geospatial community and this developing AI policy? I think that's, a, that's something that would be really valuable. You're, you're not the first one to mention that that's something that's needed, is really reliable, well-curated well and documented training data. So I, I hope that's something we do get to sooner than rather than later. Yeah, so uh, back in April, May, um, maybe it was before then, right? We, we have every, every other year at, at Oak Ridge National Lab, we have a, a workshop called the Trillium Pixel Challenge Workshop. And um, this year, of course, uh, the, with with ChatGPT and OpenAI's kind of uh, outputs this this past year, large language models were a big topic of of conversation. But just in general, generative AI was was a big focus, and the fact that there isn't a um, an, you know, an authoritative foundational model that. Uh, that is not proprietary, that is not black box, that um, the community can build on top of was, was something that, that was of, of big interest to the community of 100 researchers and government folks that were there. Um, right now, OpenAI, Google, um, Amazon, those that are building the large language models, Facebook, uh, they're all building it off the, off the internet backbone, and, and Lord knows it's a trustworthy source, right? Um, so... Um, so you know, the, the, there's there's a real concern about balancing that, and not just from the perspective of ensuring uh, equity among the views that are represented within the training data that goes to make that model, but um, ensuring that you know, back to that word trustworthiness, that that that's a component of uh, of the training data, and so maybe that's a that's a new role for the government to sponsor the, these foundational models, which you can then build bespoke mission specific models on top of that can support um, different use cases that that the different domains that would use it would would use it for. So. 
keep turning it off. All right, any other comments to, related to that? Great. Um, seeing some themes here, and also we're getting towards that the last question I'm going to ask, but thinking about you know authoritativeness, does there have to be a certain dollar amount paid for a data set or tied to, to data to make it more authoritative? Is that also a challenge? You mean, if it costs a lot of money, it must be good? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's definitely, uh, you know, if you're willing to pay for it, you know, it, it, must, be, it must be good. But I don't know, from, from our perspective, we, uh, we always start in the open. We believe that, the, you know, the best data is probably already out there. And so before we ever spend our cycles in building something new, we're going to canvas the, canvas the community. Um, and understand what is out there and what is of high value that we can utilize and then build on top of or fill in the gaps. And an example is we, we one, of, one of the kind of the most well-known uh, things that Oak Ridge produces, Oak Ridge National Lab produces for the community is the LandScan population data sets. And if you haven't ever seen it, go to landscan.ornl.gov and um, all of our, all of our, this is a plug again, right? I know. Um, all of our population data sets, most of our population data sets um, have been open sourced there for, for you guys to, to utilize, um, as well as all the methodologies behind creating them. Uh, but a big component of building those models is building data, the built environment, infrastructure, because people, you know, for 80% of our day, we're inside of a building, um, most of us, if we're not, you know, out doing construction work. Um, so we, in our models, we put people into buildings. And, you know, if you've paid attention to the geospatial news lately, Microsoft is releasing open buildings and Google is releasing open buildings. And this lady over here is producing a lot of open buildings. Um, <laughs> um, and so we, wanna, we don't want to go and create buildings for the sake of creating buildings. We want to create buildings where the community is missing those, that data. Um, and ultimately, right, leverage what's out available to, to build our population models and have, have accurate results. And so, you know, we build tools inside of Oak Ridge that go and compare Microsoft to Google to OpenStreetMap to um, some, you know, some other source that may be out there and help us understand and quantify the quality of those different sources and then identify the gaps. Um, and, and ultimately, then we can bring our own tooling to bear, AI tools to bear to, to fill in those gaps. But, um, you know, again, leverage the work of the open community before we spend a dime on, on trying, to, trying to build it. Expensive data doesn't necessarily mean it's better. I mean, so we spend a lot of money on data in my organization. And Car to Carter's point, his data must be super, super awesome because it's not cheap. Just saying. Let's get a break, my man. No, um, I've seen really good open source data and I've seen really terrible data we've bought, right? And, and the, the key is, is that in my organization, I think Amanda pointed it out earlier, was that it's a culture shift in my organization. We're, we've grown accustomed to paying money to buy specific types of data with specific attributes, it meets specific thresholds, um, and we'll pass all kinds of security checks and all kinds of checks on metadata. But if you open that data up on an image, it might be missing a road, right? Because nothing is necessarily 100% perfect. And so what's that risk you're willing to accept, right? If I have an entire country of data that I have to review in five days, well, that's not realistic, right? So you have to do sampling, right? Which you're naturally not gonna be able to review everything. And so I think there's, it, it's a interesting, um, question, but it's not, it, it's certainly not the uh, answer is more, more cost doesn't necessarily mean equal better. So. Yeah, I, I would agree. It, it's it, just because it's expensive doesn't mean it's good. Just because it's expensive or it has a cost, any cost doesn't mean it's necessarily authoritative either. Uh, I, I think where you might see the sweet spot, I'd like to think all being governed at the sweet spot is where we have, the government has invested to produce authoritative data. NAEP is a good example. That costs money, right? There's a number of agencies that give money to the to USDA to fly the world, the country with imagery. 
every every year. Every couple of years, the whole country is refreshed. That's an investment that Congress thought was worth the, the bang for the buck. 3D elevation program on LIDAR is the same thing. It's a very expensive program, but the value's there. There's a return on investment to that. It's authoritative data. It does cost money, but it does seem that it's it's worth the investment, and Congress saw that with by giving us the and our partners the ability to, to do that. Uh, we run into trouble in other places where we weren't able to purchase data, we, even if it might have fit the a definition of authoritative or it was high quality because it just wasn't a sustainable cost model for us. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, we've got citizen science data that costs us very little to, to use, but it turns out to be very high quality and very useful. Thanks for taking the curveball question. Um, <laughs> So going back to your processes, I think, Carl, I'll ask the next question to you. Uh, it sounds like Oak Ridge kind of has certain processes and embedding models in place to take all these different data sets and kind of, you know, make the cream come to the top. You know? So how, can you talk a little bit more about your processes for, you know, reviewing the data that you use, um, whether it's coming from AI or, or BGI or any other source? Uh, you know, I don't know that we've got a singular process. I've got several folks out there in the crowd, and Jessica, Aaron, Jason, that spend a lot of their days trying to make sense of what, what data can we trust that's out there and where do we need to then fill in the gaps. Um, so, so they're probably the better ones to tell you about the processes, and so go see Jessica and Jason and Aaron. Um, I'll just, you know, just pass the buck there. Um, but I'll, you know, given where we are on, on time, I'll, I'll, uh, I was thinking as I was sitting down and, and, you know, Eddie was up this earlier today talking, it was four years ago, five years ago, that Eddie and I and Nathan, Nate, Nate Franz, who was just on the panel, wrote the state, uh, wrote, a, wrote a, the future of foundation geoint as part of USGIF's state and future of of GeoInt uh, compendium that they put together in, in, it was the 2019 edition, but it came out in Jan January 2019. And, um, and so at the time, the three kind of pillars of that were, uh, were leveraging the cloud, AI, and VGI, crowdsourced data, right? And, and so this is not a new concept, but um, I think all of these components are, are maturing to be, um, to be parts of the conversation, like inevitable and, and always there parts of the conversation. It's not a stretch now to think that we're gonna have volunteer geographic information as part of the, the NGA, author I was with NGA at the time, the NGA authoritative data baseline or the USGS authoritative data baseline. Um, and volunteer geographic information doesn't have to mean it's coming from the public that is digitizing data in, in OpenStreetMap. It could be coming from your partners, uh, because Lord knows, right, the, the, the army on the ground. I remember Nathan wrote as part of this, this, uh, this paper that we wrote that, you know, the data that's collected in the field is, is of the highest quality, it's of the highest resolution, and we at the time, you know, and I still, today, we're, we're probably not even the best at it, but we, we at the time lack the ability to bring that great data from the edge back into the mothership, as, it as we would call it, and, and integrate that in with the foundational data. Um, and so now that machine learning is maturing and, and you know, we've got constant, the, the ability to, not that we're always doing it, but we've got the ability to constantly crank out data. Um, we, we need new processes and we need new capabilities and we need the help of the community to understand how we can kind of bring all these things together to, um, to kind of tie it all in a bow because these, these components are now understood to be parts of the solution. Um, it's, just a, it's just a process of getting them all together that, that um, we've got to work through. So. I, I think there might be two questions in there for how do we validate or what kind of practices might we want to employ for AI generated data and what do we use for, for VGI data. I think those two might require different solutions. At, at least for the National Map Corps, we've got some self-policing. We experienced users that have reached a threshold of contributions. They're able to, and we allow them to edit and review some of the newer users or those that don't have as much experience. Uh, and then there is a government review that's in there as well. So there's a, a tiered system of review that makes that data high quality. 
Uh, with the AI data, that's a, I think a different moral of wax in how we develop a process. Uh, whether it's, if it's a generative AI in the front of a web page, it says, you ask a question, what's the, what's the temperature of the water in the lower Colorado River right now, and searches USGS holdings. How do we validate that uh, versus something that might be a pattern recognition or something working on imagery to create a vector product that might require a different path. Uh, just one anecdote of an article that I read, maybe some of you did too, uh, a lawyer got in a lot of trouble for using ChatGPT to help uh, write one of his arguments in a court of law, and it sounds great, saved us some time. The issue was the AI generated cases that never existed. <laughs> And the judge called him on it, and, and somehow that AI was able to make up stuff. Uh, and it wasn't based in, in some evidence or fact that he had, he had scooped. So that's something we would need to validate. If we're going to be asking AI systems in the future to generate data, generate geospatial data, it's going to be synthetic, but it should have a, a basis. If it's interpolation or extra, extrapolation, that might be acceptable within some threshold, but it shouldn't be creating something that really is off base. And that, that's a, it's an excellent question. I don't think we have the answers yet for how we validate that, especially if we're going to be putting our government stamps on it to, to make it a product that we deliver to the public. So for us, we do multi-tiered um, approach to data validation and checks. So we have automation that looks through the data and looks through attribution of the data and makes sure it meets all these key thresholds. And then we do visual inspections. As I said before, the world's a pretty big place. Uh, so naturally, we can't look at every single piece of pixel on the ground. Um, but that's why we're investing and we're building more visual inspection tools, things that will help um, kind of key our analysts into to problem areas or areas of higher complexity complexity where we, we anticipate there would be more uh, issues with the data we receive from folks. Awesome. Um, for my last question is kind of a call out to this community and thinking about what do we need to enable or even articulate as an open geo community to um, kind of accelerate this shift and interpretation of authoritative given all of the new data sources out there and you know maybe pick one or two things you think that we could potentially do over the next you know, six to 12 months I'm no, just kidding um, hopefully when we celebrate the 15th uh, at geo day we're going to be talking about this very differently so who wants to start with that one sure all right I'll start um so I think that the, the there's two areas where I think that uh, we have some some research horizons that are going to be fun to tackle. Uh, that'll be fun to collaborate with with all of you in here on. Um, the we're really good at you know from a geospatial perspective, this is a geospatial community, right? So we're really good at creating things that come out of satellite imagery, derivatives of satellite imagery. We, we at Oak Ridge and you know, probably many of you can create building footprints or roads or some other feature, land cover feature coming out of satellite imagery really fast, really easy. You know, um, or if you can build a model and hopefully do that at large areas. Uh, but what comes out of that is generally a one-dimensional data set. It's a, it's a, you know, if you take that raster output of your computer vision model and you turn it into a polygon, now you've got a polygon, but it's just an empty data set. We need to put meaning behind these polygons and, and um, characterize them so that those downstream users can, can use them to make sense of the world. So one research horizon is the attribution, the characterization of the features that we see in satellite imagery that the humans naturally can do, right? When I, as, as a little piece of prep, I didn't really have a chance to talk much about it, but I looked up NGA's GeoIt Content Extraction Standard, um, uh, which is the guide that NGA puts out for all of their contractors to extract features that would go in their maps. Um, it's 400 pages long, and it describes all the different attributes and all the different attribute fields that you would use if you're characterizing the world so that you can make a cartographic product that the Army or Navy or uh, Air Force could, could use. Uh, so we've got to help the machines get to that level of smart. And I don't know that they'll ever be as smart as a human when it comes to map interpretation, maybe. Um, but we've got to help the machines be able to characterize what it sees with, within the satellite imagery um, in more than a one-dimensional fashion. The second piece is you know, the, the, the industry that's out there um, 
is getting better and better at producing data from the, the volumes of satellite imagery that are being collected every day. And all of that data is flowing into Mike and Will. And they need to be able to know how good it is. And so we need to figure out the right ways to use artificial intelligence to support the quality control process and quality assurance process so that they can know and measure that trustworthiness of the data. How complete is it? How accurate is it spatially? How accurate is it from an attribute perspective? And so um, that's things that we're thinking about on the R&D front. And uh, I think those will be of high value to, to you guys on the government side and uh, challenge the community here to start thinking about those things as well. There's one TED talk that I did this. There's one TED talk that I really like. It came out probably a good six, seven years ago, and it was uh, by an author who wrote a book called The Entrepreneurial State. One of the things she articulated was an old philosophy about the role of government. And there's a quote in it that I really like that what we do on the government side are things that are not a little better or a little worse than anybody else. We do the things that nobody else is doing because maybe they don't have the incentive, they don't have the expertise, they don't have the capacity. I think to your question about what are the roles in the community or what do we need from the community, or what do you need from the government agencies, uh, although you're all government, so it's sort of speaking to the choir, uh, what are the niches, the niches? What are, is only USGS qualified to do or best qualified to do or NGA qualified to do or best qualified to do versus uh, OSM or versus OGC or versus somebody or somebody else? If you have a sustainable model to create data that meets our specifications and needs, there's no reason we need to be duplicating and we need to be communicating what those, those barriers are and what those roles are. On the other hand, you're not gonna be collecting nationwide LIDAR. Uh, that's something, that's why there's a congressional investment because there's no, uh, right, there's no, uh, nobody's been able to figure out a business model to do it cheap enough to make money uh, other than have the government fund it through contract. So you, you might see some other cases. Orthoimagery is a really good example. Back in the, the 90s and 2000s, that was a government mission. Now you can, you can go buy imagery all, all day long. Uh, until that switches, that's still a, a government responsibility. That fits in that category of things nobody else are doing because they don't have the incentive or the means or, or, the, uh, or otherwise the imperative or capacity. Uh, so that, that's at least what I'd like to see is maybe some communication about expectation, uh, whether it's AI algorithm development, whether it's maybe about the, the data development, element, I talked about training data sets, the expertise, is that coming from academia, is it coming from private sector? Uh, I think that's a, an area that could be improved upon. I would ditto to both comments. No, I mean, I think there's certainly there's the aspect that we need to understand. Like, I would love to understand the hard problem sets from outside coming back to us. Because one of the things I strive for when I was doing open source development was ensuring that a lot of the capabilities we were developing made it back to the public. Because I think that's important because it honestly feeds back to better data, better capabilities for the, the wider good. So I think there needs to be a closer partnership and we need to build those relationships. Um, and what were you talking about, Convenience? Nah, I can't remember, whatever. Oh, see, this is what happens, it's late in the day. That's, it's attribution, I don't remember. But, yeah, teaching the machines to help us, I guess. I, I honestly don't remember. I think the thing I was gonna try and get at was, as we see technology continue to proliferate and you see people like Google's and Microsoft's, they're, they're doing things now that weren't done necessarily very well, let's say five years ago, right? It continues to get better. So what's the, what's the next, what's the future, right? And let's not be content with what the computers are doing now and in the next year, but start thinking about, sort of to Carter's point, no, it hit me, was the characterization of, of features, right? It's not enough to just have that building on the ground. I, I wanna know what the materials are of that building. I want to know what, you know, what's the roof made of? What's, and the more the computers can do that and save us time and energy, the more our analysts and our warfighters, the less they have to focus on that. And they can focus on the actual intel that's on the ground there. All right, who has a question for this panel? Yep. We were going to learn from the high school crowd. And really bring the microphone close to your mouth so we can hear you. Hello. When you started to define what was authoritative, 
I was hoping that I would hear the words data integrity, data accuracy, and even data that is impervious to perspective. We all know that we're human beings, and with being human beings, we come with issues that may not be 100% correct. But over the past years, what I think that we have all come to realize, and especially after COVID, is we're one people on the planet and we need to work together. So my question to the team today, whether you believe this question or the answer is going to be what you consider for government or for private sector, since we have human beings that is creating the data training sets, my question to you is, in order to ensure that this authoritative data is free from perspective, accurate, and has some integrity, are there multiple teams being put together to not only test the data, but to test the integrity of those who have created the training sets? Those are all excellent points. And while we didn't use those terms that you did, we did talk about QA and QC, and the accuracy and the data that's free from perspective or unbiased, I think is, uh, that's the kind of things we wanna see from QA and QC processes, especially on training data. If you've got data that's only trained on white affluent networks, that's gonna produce a response from an AI network that you don't want. Uh, I think that's gonna be baked into the policies and procedures that we have in developing these, and I, I say that because if you you look at the policy that's starting to be developed at the federal level, and there's a, an office within OSTP, the National AI Advancement Office. Uh, they've developed some strategies and R&D strategies for the federal government, and they specifically call out some of those things that you're talking about to make sure there's transparency in the data sets, there's, there's equity in the training data sets, and the people understand that it is being based on broad-based data set that's representative of all of us, and that it, it is, is really integral to understanding how AI is used and the answers that it comes up with. So wholeheartedly agree, and I, I think we're going, I hope we're going into this eyes wide open, and the documents I've seen so far reflects that we are. So I'm, I'm optimistic about that. I would just add, I, one of the challenges, and I can't speak for everybody up here, but one of the challenges with training data itself and the reason why it's so difficult is because it's not like I'm taking a building one time. I have to take that building 20 or 30 times from 20 or 30 different perspectives, and that gives me a confidence score in that, that output. And so that's where I think we're learning as we go but that's where we're building that confidence along the way. So to, to your point, it's not just one individual's perspective on something. You're getting a whole group of individuals that are agreeing, yeah, that's this building, this is the location, and this is what it does. Good question. Yeah, that's greatly, I could just speak to data ROI. And I, I think at the end, Maggie maybe was right from the start. Uh, Maybe it's related to the, uh, you know, the value and the investment of the data, but uh, generally, can you, a lot of the challenge we have with data quality is, uh, you know, incentivizing data creators to actually characterize, you know, uncertainty and et cetera. So if, if we rewarded, well, starting with measuring data ROI, can you speak to data ROI and, and some ideas on how to formalize that, um, that kind of concept and tracking? Show me the mine. So I can take a stab at it. So historically, the way we've produced data or had data produced was along a certain threshold. And, and it was requirements driven and it was driven by, hey, I need country X collected because it's over this many years old. Um, what we're trying to drive to is more of a data grooming kind of change detection um, environment where, hey, there's change actually happening here in the world. This is where we need to fix our data and make it better. And by doing that, it's, 
allowing our analysts more time to focus on those features and add additional attribution that maybe we didn't have in the past. It's enabling us to look at other sources that are out there to enrich those, those vector data with those vector data with information that we hadn't traditionally thought of or collected. Um, and then really driving, we're moving towards some like foundation digital twin where you know we want to collect data at the city level and let computers do what they do best, which is thinning data out, right? Well, to get to that point um, is a significant jump from where we've been in the past. And so um, more to follow, but I mean, what we're trying to implement within our organization are those mechanisms and those processes that will enrich data, but to your point, having a mechanism where, hey, we could incentivize the public to add additional attribution, I think is a great concept. It's how do we do it legally? And uh, I would be happy to help, but legally we're sort of limited in, in what we can do, so. So the, the ROI is a big, a big, um, concern or area of importance for us as, as, a, as a data set producer, because we want to show lots of value to Will so that uh, he, he sees value in the data sets that we build for, um, for him and, and others uh, in the community. Uh, one of the ways that we do that is through DOI citations, but you know most people in the government that are reusing data aren't going to cite, um, you use a DOI citation, but Aaron, Aaron showed DOI for our outage data. Uh, we have DOIs for all of our land scan data sets. So that's 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 one way we've we've kind of leveraged what uh, what's the opportunities from the, the academic sector to give our data some something that's citable and referenceable so that you can easily go into the the academic literature in that case and see how many times has this data set been cited uh, across all of all of science. Um, Unfortunately, though, we have we have kind of a black box once it goes over into the the government user realm, right? And there's probably a lot of use that just isn't captured, or isn't isn't well cited or well referenced in that regard. So that's uh, that's something that we should collectively try to figure out. I think that's all the time that we have. Thanks, panelists, for your thoughts and time, and thanks to all of you. I'm gonna turn it back over to Eddie. <laughs>everybody to come up to the stage for our next panel um, did you well, let me see I can advance the slide myself uh, hang on the um, it's not as easy as on zoom but it's a lot more fun to have you guys here um, let me just get to the our panel here okay so uh, I Thank you, Chris, for uh, that excellent keynote and kicking off our panel where open science meets phosphor G. Um, the, uh, the, on our panel, uh, I want to uh, say hello to everybody from Sof Dr. Sophia Liu. Um, Sophia was <clears throat> instrumental in putting this together but was unable to attend due to exigencies at uh, USGS at the last second, so I'm going to stand in as the moderator. But while Chris is coming back, I'd like the panelists to just introduce themselves, and we'll start with Paige. Just introduce yourself and your work, and then we'll just uh, kick off the panel. Yes, hello. Great, my mic is working. Hello, uh, my name is Paige Martin. I am a support scientist in NASA's Office of the Chief Science Data Officer, and we work to support and enable open science at NASA and beyond. Hey, uh, I'm Ryan Aberrathy. I'm an oceanographer and climate scientist by training. I've been a professor at Columbia University for the past decade, but uh, in the past year, I recently went on leave from that and started uh, our new company called Earthmover, where we're building a cloud data platform for scientific data. Uh, morning, everyone. 
Uh, I'm Sudhi Shrestha. Uh, I'm with the NOAA Office of Water Prediction. So uh, I'm technical manager for the Web and Data Service Program. So what we are trying to do about how, how, how to make our data a lot more interoperable and accessible to the large our hydrology program. So this is a great, uh, great actually community. This is my first time being in the first 4G, so I'm very excited about this panel, and thanks for taking time. And Chris Holmes with Planet. I just blathered a lot. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Kick it off with, and I'll just start coming back down the line again. Um, Paige, if you wouldn't mind starting out with, can you describe how uh, NASA and your programs at NASA uh, support open science and how open source software in this community, uh, collaborating with this community, uh, might benefit those open science efforts? Yeah, so NASA it has really prioritized open science. Um, actually, for quite a while, it's made um, NASA data has been openly available, not necessarily readily usable, um, for many decades, and so that's what we're really working on now. Um, so um, we have something called the Open Source Science Initiative, um, and this is really where the core of the support for open science comes from. We're looking at uh, establishing policies for NASA scientists and NASA-funded scientists on how to do their work openly. Uh, we're looking at incentives, so that includes funding incentives, so what funding can we put in place to support communities like, like you in doing the, uh, work openly. Um, we're also running some prizes and, and challenges to really incentivize um, open principles while doing scientific research. Um, and we also have a community aspect, um, which is NASA's Transform to Open Science, or TOPS initiative, uh, and that's really trying to engage the community because we recognize that open science isn't just about, um, the, the products isn't just about making our data and our software open, it's about this culture change um, where we, we do our science in a more collaborative way, um, where we can really build upon one another's work um, and not have to reinvent the wheel, um, but we recognize that that um, affects the incentives for individuals um, compared to kind of all of science. Where we see this as progressing science faster, we'll, we'll be able to build on top of everyone's work, but for any individual, it might take a little bit more time to, to do your work in a more open way, to uh, establish the right um, you know, documentation and metadata for your code um, and, and your data. So. Um, so that's really uh, one of our big focuses, is engaging with the community. Then um, uh, we also are looking at infrastructure. So this is what infrastructure do we need um, that would be kind of core across all of NASA. Um, that's where we're starting right now because we don't even have that within NASA. And then hopefully we can expand to work with other government agencies and organizations as well. So how... Uh, you know, working with the communities like this one, I have to say, this is my first FOS4G. It's very exciting. Um, it's been a really wonderful and welcoming community so far. Um, and I, I see a lot, of, a lot of potential collaboration. So a lot of what we do at NASA and other government agencies, we sometimes move a bit slower than some of the open source communities that we might all be familiar with, which can be a little annoying on one side, but I think it's also nice to have different entities that are moving at different timescales. It takes us some time, but we do listen to the community. So at NASA, especially NASA Earth Science and Earth Data, we are using a lot of the tools that you all are help develop, helping to develop. Um, we're using Stack, we're using Czar. It took us a little while to get there, but we are now full steam ahead. Um, and so a lot of what you can do is kind of continuing to do what, what you're doing um, and make it known. Um, you know, make sure to talk to people like me at NASA and others so that we know uh, what you're doing. And it does, it might take some time, but we do digest that and we try and then use these tools um, ourselves and also give back, um, you know, through funding and, and other opportunities. So. Um, I guess that's what I'll say for now, and I'll let others continue. Okay. Ryan, how about in your work at Earthmover? What, how are you all supporting our open science? And how could this collaboration help? You know, for, for me, my journey into open science starts long before Earthmover. It goes back to around 2015, when I was more or less still a normal uh, mainstream scientist, <laughs> uh, not a data person. And this 
some of my colleagues at NASA JPL ran an ocean model at groundbreaking, unprecedented high resolution to simulate things like ocean eddies and tides, global one kilometer mesh, which doesn't sound like a lot maybe to the imagery people, but uh, this model dumped out four petabytes of data onto a NASA supercomputer. And the data was absolutely gorgeous and fascinating. The little peaks we were able to get inside of that very opaque, dense, four petabyte data set. And I was just struck by the gap between how transformative this data was gonna be for our field and how inaccessible it was, even to me, a very capable and you know, well-resourced researcher, let alone to the thousands of other potential users of that data you know, in the US, in the developing world. You know? And at that moment, I kind of had this big pivot in my career to, to really focus on this question of how can we make all of this amazing weather, climate, ocean data much more accessible and how can we scale up our approach to working with data to, to meet this challenge of petabytes and petabytes of our system data. That led me down a path of getting involved in open source software. I started working on open source Python tooling for working with data, uh, packages like X-Array and Czar. And we started the Pangeo Project, which is a community platform and uh, organization uh, aimed at sort of coordinating efforts around um, uh, scaling up data analytics in climate and adjacent fields. We got involved in the cloud because we saw that the cloud had the potential to be this sort of common ground where uh, everyone could access the same data and could access computing to work with that data. Uh, that's a much better situation than when the data was locked up on one agency supercomputer where you needed to six month security clearance process to even get access. So there's been a lot of progress that's been made. We started Earthmover because we saw that the process of moving to a cloud native data infrastructure for scientific data was still too inaccessible. It required a lot of really custom engineering and a lot of expertise that was not well distributed in our community. So our goal is to build a platform that's gonna make it easier to bring scientific data into the cloud, distribute it in the sort of cloud native spatial data infrastructure that Chris talked about, and to make those capabilities uh, available to any organization, agency, or company who wants them. So that's what we're trying to do today. Cool. Severe, I, you know, um, how it, no, I mean, there's a lot of no, obviously, but how, how would, your open science efforts benefit from collaboration with this community, you think? Thanks, Eddie. I think very, very relevant, right? I, I, I just want to actually start my days when I was in grad school, why I am motivated here and so glad to be in this community. Again, uh, to acknowledge this is my first 4G, uh, first, uh, first 4G as well. But I, I remember when I was in grad school trying to do my research and trying to find the data, I couldn't find one. Right, I was trying to scrape the data from NASA, I was trying to scrape the data from NOAA, but I did not know where to really find them. Right, I did not know anyone, I didn't have any point of contact to ask for data sets, there are so many, uh, there are so many places that you could go, right? So, being, remembering those days, sort of motivation around, if there's an opportunity for me to come back to any institution like that, and see if I can make that data a lot more available and accessible to the users, that would have been great and fantastic. So my career journey, I had an opportunity to work in academia and the industry, but then I came back to work for NOAA. As a port of flight in, 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 uh, in weather service, especially in, like in our hydro program now, what we're trying to do is actually try to collaborate with the open source community as well as the COTS, right? We, as a government, we just need to make sure that we have a, uh, users who are in the both domain of the bucket, both buckets, some are using the, the open source, some are using the COTS. So we just need to find sort of bridge where we can actually get uh, cross path those opportunities as well, right? As a part of that, what we're trying to do and what I see this community can help us also is to bridge that gap as well, right? Because a lot of you work in the open source community as well as the COTS, right? And then the some of the work that we're doing to make our data set a lot more accessible, I think there will be a lot also conversation about like 
the how it's going to enable the open science, right? The, the, the challenge that we have is like, not only the data that's available sitting somewhere else, but how we're going to make it available to the larger community. Now that you know, everybody is moving towards the cloud, how those on-prem systems and the data system that we have will be available in the cloud. And talking about some of the talk about the Chris talk about like you know, cloud native and geospatial, that's the domain we would like to go down there. So we're trying to work and work this community to help us actually get into that direction. So we are trying ourselves, but what we're doing is not uh, enough to help to accelerate that. So what I'm expecting for this community is like, you know, uh, we are able to share our data and the services through the repository, right? We have data sitting there, but we, we produce a whole lot of data set, but how we're going to make it available to larger uses is something that we need also your help to uh, make that happen, right? And that's why we also participate in a lot of the open science initiatives, like, you know, uh, some of this year uh, you're, uh, you may be aware of, like, you know, this year, OSTP actually announced the 2023 as a year of open science, right? So the, basically what we're trying to do, actually foster the collaboration within all the federal governments as well, so that we are working together to enable the data to everybody. So that, you know, that actually leverages the data and the service, but we're, a lot of the times when you talk about the open science, we're only talking about the data as well, but there are a lot to it, right? Because there are a lot of the uh, software content to it. There's a lot, all, also the, the research output comes out at those are publications that are, uh, how we're going to make those available to larger community. And the software code base, how we're going to maintain some of those code base is also one of our challenges as well, right? So, a lot of you contribute back into some of those software development as well, but how, as a government, we can have access to those and interact with the community, this is something we're looking forward to. So I, I, I do see that there's a lot more opportunity to actually collaborate with the stakeholders and the government can be one of the players to help accelerate some of the uh, open science effort in this community. So we're looking forward to that collaboration. Thanks, dear. Yeah. Chris, you identified some of the planet open science efforts here. Can you talk a little bit more about how Planet is sitting in the interface there between open science and uh, open source software? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, they didn't really talk about Planet at all, but we have a constellation of satellites that take pictures of the Earth, and uh, the founders were all from NASA, and so that sort of open science is very much in their blood, and the way we tend to work is partnering with different people who are able to kind of help fund us to open data. So the NICFI, uh, I think it's Norway's forest initiative has uh, funded completely open data for the tropics. Um, and we've seen yeah, a whole bunch of people building deforestation stuff and planetary variables on top of that. Uh, and yeah, we have a whole education research program that makes the data available to a number of institutions. And then through NASA, any uh, researcher in the federal government, not just NASA, but uh, NOAA, et cetera, who's doing research can access the full planet archive. So yeah, it's definitely something that we really wanna see and encourage as much as possible. Cool. I wanna speak a little bit for Sophia, and um, as she has in her title the um, participatory open science lead at USGS. So there's a lot of open science. And Sophia and I spent a good bit of time talking about open science means different things to different people. But I do know for, uh, for certain that USGS has a number of programs that are very much about citizens contributing to scientific efforts and then bringing it together. So one thing I, I will just uh, say for this conference and also for the Fed Geo Day uh, gathering, which is, I think one of the keys for open science and open source software collaboration is just us getting together. And Chris, you really laid out that, the, you know, the meeting of data and software and standards. Well, it needs to happen here in this kind of forum. So uh, one of the things I would uh, also say in terms of fostering this collaboration is that anybody here that wants to help uh, me and Guido and Maggie Colley and Sophia and the people who are convening these things, um, please let me know if you're interested in helping us with the next Phosphor G North America so that we can continue this dialogue and, uh, you know, make these forums uh, happen. Matt Hansen, other, many other people here on the, uh, that have volunteered to help that. So this 
in a way, part of my answer on the collaboration is to bring you guys together. All right, I just want to quickly go to the next question, and this is, I'll start with Sadir because this is a really specifically uh, down your line. How will open science benefit the weather, water, and climate enterprise, and what role it will Phosphor G, if at all, play in that collaboration help make that happen? Thanks, Eddie. I think you just touched the heart of the what I do, right? So thank yeah. you. Uh, <laughs> very relevant questions, right? So, you know, what we're trying to do a lot more focus on the, you know, the weather, water, and then the, cli uh, the climate enterprise. I, I do focus a lot more on the water enterprise, but like, you know, in, in general, the community, what we're trying to build is that will help us in a sense, like what we're trying to do right now, like I just said earlier, like, you know, we want to make sure that our data sets is a lot more accessible, right? How are we going to do that? For, for till now, all of our data sets, most of the our data sets, at least in our program, are sitting on our on-prem system, right? And from there, we have an issue of the infrastructure, right? Because we don't have enough bandwidth to make the data set available. So a lot of the times, I'm sure you may have experienced, like you're trying to download data, you may got throttle or you may got banned, right? You got banned, blacklisted sometimes, right? Uh, so, but there is a reason to it because like, you know, there are a lot, we want to make sure the bandwidth is available to everyone, right? And so that the, the data set is available to everyone. So there is equal distribution of the data access to provide to that. So how we're going to overcome some of those challenges that I read right now. So what we're trying to do actually move some of our, those data sets into the cloud. And that's where like, okay, most of, all of you may be aware, like uh, right now, the way our, the forecast data sets are coming out as a NetCDF, right? We're writing that as a NetCDF because that's what, how we store our data sets. But all of you who've been working on that in this domain know the how challenging it can be when you're trying to access the data in NetCDF, right? And you're trying to do the, uh, any large analysis in the cloud. Right. So that's where some of the work that I see here in this community group, like trying to work on cloud native, cloud optimized data, some of the work like, you know, Brian has led on the doing and then the Chris has led uh, doing on the optimizing the data available in the cloud, right? So that's, that is what we're trying to do, get, just get started. Like, and I also want to resonate some of what uh, Pivage was talking about, like, you know, yes, we're a little bit slow, right? But there is a reason, you know, we have, we do not have tremendous amount of resources, right? So, and again, we, we just want to make sure that, you know, we have, because we have to go through the procedures to make the data sets available to the larger community, right? Because, so, it's, and that's why the, the, the pace can be some, somewhat slow, but we're not that slow, right? I'm positive about it. I mean, we're not that slow. I mean, there are some folks who are trying to work with the community here. We're trying to work with academia and also the private industry to make sure that we are in the pace, right? So that's where we're actually heading towards right now is to make sure that, you know, all the data that's coming up, at least of the, our program, on the, the water side, what we're trying to do is we get the data set, but the data is also accessible, but in a way that the people can use them and make sense of out of it, right? So we are working towards that, but like if that's what we're trying to do, trying to make, uh, I don't know if you're aware of that, like NOAA has a uh, program called, you know, uh, data dissemination or the open data dissemination effort. That's where we actually move the data into all three uh, uh, cloud service providers, right? That's their Microsoft, uh, uh, AWS, and then the uh, Google. So what we're trying to do is make all our data set available into the, uh, to the, those uh, cloud providers. And also trying to make sure that the data sets are actually cloud optimized as much as possible, but th we're heading into that direction. So what I can see the opportunity here <laughs> with this community actually that you can help us to get to that stage, right? Definitely, like, there, we need to find some, some way that, you know, how we can improve the data access, but also some collaborative research that we can uh, work on, right? And please reach out. I will be here all day today to talk through. But definitely looking forward to some of those collaboration and the feedback as well, right? This is something we're pretty new on the cloud, uh, cloud uh, optimized work that we're trying data, we're trying to for, uh, make available to the public. But this is something we like uh, you to go and get some of our data and provide us the feedback and help us grow. This is something I think I, uh, this is where I see like there's an opportunity to innovate 
some of the, the work that we're trying to do here and having definitely trust to what we do and some of the transparency. We're trying to be transparent, what we're trying to do and share the data to the community. So definitely, and in the last, what I'll say is like, you know, uh, from the government perspective, we can also help some of the accelerate and sort of coordinate some of the efforts around here, right? So that, you know, you can help us uh, in our work, what we're trying to do, but also we can help you to get there. So this is something like, you know, we can work together in that domain. I'm looking forward to a lot more. Is, um, I mean, just I'll, I'll take a little different tack on that and I'll start with Paige here. Um, are there other federal mandates or specific agency goals that you see that this collaboration between the, your open science efforts and the Phosphor G community would further? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, it is interesting working in government. I've been here for less than a year, and before that I was a postdoc doing climate research. Um, I realized several of them kind of said their introductory kind of stories of how they got here. Um, that, was, that was kind of mine. I was in the climate modeling community. Um, very interestingly, it seems like a largely different community than this one, but they seem very similar. Um, and I think we, I could see a lot more um, you know, communication and collaboration with those communities. Um, and I, in this year working at NASA, I have really understood how important it is to have these government mandates and to have the government um, you know, working on some of this open science. So we might seem a little slow. We have a lot more structures in place that we have to follow sometimes than a lot of the rest of the community. Um, and that's, I think, really where we, we benefit from collaborating with people like you. I know you all work in very different sectors with your own uh, you know, red tape, um, but we all have our different uh, the red tape in different ways. I think that's really where I can see this kind of collaboration um, being really fruitful for all of us. Um, and so I guess going back a little bit to the previous um, question, talking specifically about like climate and weather and water science, um, I mean, these are inherently global sciences. We have oceans and land and rivers and weather <laughs> everywhere on the planet. And especially with things like climate change, we really want to make sure that we get research and we can take climate action in all the locations around the globe. And what that really means is engaging scientists and researchers and decision makers and software developers and data managers in every location on the globe. And to do that, we need to make sure that we are not putting in, putting in place barriers based on the tools and the data that we're using. So to me, this is really one of the uh, best aspects of, of this idea of open science, that we can really engage with the entire globe so we can actually address these very important issues that everyone uh, is going to face and is already facing today. Um, so as far as these federal mandates, I mean, one of the reasons why we are here today, why NASA and NOAA and many other agencies are really putting open science at the forefront um, was from um, a memo that came out of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy um, that said they want um, basically equitable access to government funded data and research. Um, now that's very specific in the U.S., and that is one of, one of the things that we are working within. We are U.S. government agencies, so we are prioritizing U.S. communities, and that's where I think this collaboration with, with all of you um, uh, can really help make that more international. Um, so that, that's kind of where we are coming from in a lot of this. Um, yeah, NASA is really big about making their data available to everyone. Um, that's, I wouldn't say that's a mandate, but that is one of our big goals. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, you can't, but we can't really, as, as Chris was mentioning in his talk, we can't really talk just about the data. It's this whole structure, um, this infrastructure altogether, the software, um, the, the standards, all of these things. 
Um, and so that's really where this community comes in and helping to set some of these standards, um, helping to create some of this infrastructure so that we really can make our data available. So um, yeah, that's, that's my, <laughs> my response there. Ryan, you're kind of working at it from the problem up. I mean, how, how, how do you see the collaboration with the open science and open source communities furthering federal societal goals too? It's a great question. I, I want to try a little audience participation here to get at th this. So raise your hand if you're personally concerned about the climate crisis. <laughs> Keep your hand up if you feel like the work you're doing in your day job is contributing in some even an infinitesimal way towards the solution. That's awesome to see, right? So one thing that's changed that I've seen over the past 10 years is the awareness of the urgency of the climate problem. And you can see that in the room today. I bet, I bet there's a lot more hands up today than there would have been at this conference 10 years ago. Um, we can, though, especially see this in what's happening in the private sector. There is a huge interest in the climate problem, not just from, as an academic research problem, but as something that is affecting the bottom line of so many businesses uh, across the economy. So we're seeing this explosion of you know, climate tech, right, which means a lot of different things, uh, but a big part of that means using data, much of it geospatial data, to make decisions about how this economy is going to adapt to climate change. In the open science world, we care a lot about reproducibility as like one of the virtues of open, open science. And it's, it's almost so widely accepted that like we don't even question like why we care about reproducibility. Like it's just like, oh, it's like, a, it's like one of the 10 commandments of open science is it's supposed to be reproducible. As I've gotten to understand the private sector perspective, I've learned that reproducibility has this flip side that's very, very important to many big companies and organizations, which is transparency of how decisions are being made. How, you know, if, if a company decides they're going to raise your insurance policy because uh, your home is now at some increased uh, risk for wildfire, people want to know why. They want to understand how that decision was reached, what data went into it, what sort of processing and analysis went into that. Regulators want to know these things and, in fact, need to start regulating this type of climate information much more carefully than they are today. Um, so the role that sort of open science and open source software and open data can play is to create this transparency in and reproducibility in how we're using climate information to make these really important society-wide decisions. And that information should not just be locked up within you know, a few analysts or a few companies that are sort of doing that work. That is really everyone's right to understand, examine, and scrutinize how those decisions are being made. So what does that mean in practice? Well, uh, open standards are a big part of this. Right. how we share and exchange data. Um, things like being able to identify the provenance of data, understanding where data came from. <clears throat> and a much harder problem, I think, is understanding how analysis was performed, particularly once we start using relatively opaque models, like AI-based models, how those models are, are reaching their conclusions, making that code and those models open and available to scrutiny, uh, uh, available to build upon. These are all things that are good from an open science point of view, but they're also going to really accelerate our species' uh, ability to adapt to this really urgent crisis. So um, that's a pretty great motivation, I think, for all of us to keep working on this, yeah. keep trying to work together and improve the way all of our systems interoperate with, with this big challenge and goal in mind. Well, thank you, Ryan. Sudhir, I know that NOAA has many 
policies, goals, et cetera. How would this collaboration, could you elaborate any more on how this open science, open source software collaboration might help you meet mandates that you're facing or going to face? So, again, like, you know, so the mandates, I will not talk about, say, the mandates, but, you know, this our goal, right? Because we want, our primary goal is to serve the American yeah. public, right? And what we would like to do is to make sure our data is available, but again, the requirement had changed, right? Because if you remember before, we're able to put our data sets into the FTP server, and then we say, okay, now data is publicly available, right? But what does that mean, right? Because that data is available, but really not available, right? So we're sort of like a gearing, from there to moving towards the, how we actually make our data set a lot more accessible. I think that's where we're moving towards. You know, so there is a mandate like, in, yes, we, you know, there is a requirement that you know, all the, the most of the data set that are coming out of the, our uh, the research and also the, the operational data, that's available to the public for use, yeah. right? So, so that's, that's the goal we're heading towards and we're trying to make sure that the, those data sets are usable. And uh, again, like, you know, the, what Ryan was trying to say, like a repeatable, that is something like, you know, we also would like to make sure there's a data integrity as well, right? We do, we want to make sure the, the, the data sets that we're making available has the uh, enough, enough metadata to that, what that indexing to the users. A lot of the times the data set is there with uh, make it available, but they don't know what the data means, right? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to do some due diligence now to make sure that we have a rich metadata as as possible. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you who are working on the data domain, nobody likes to do that metadata job, right? Because that's a hard thing to do, right? So we're actually working diligently to make sure that you're working, uh, we're spending time to write the the metadata that follows the standards as well, because the standard standardization is also something we're looking at, right? So this is the, so, but the, uh, uh, one of the important thing for open science is not only like, you know, the data itself, but also how the data set is available, but also the processes that goes behind that, right? A lot of the, the research publication that's coming out, right? How can we make that uh, the work available so that that processes can be repeated by someone else? Right, so, so, that, so that's the goal we're heading towards. Okay, cool. Chris, you've heard a lot of different responses and reactions now to your challenge, and you've been on standards body center. How do you see, uh, do you have any more thoughts or is there anything that popped to your mind now on open science, FOSS, communication, uh, collaboration? Yeah, I think one of the things that's going in my mind is just, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, one, the ease, like how we can make this as easy as possible mm -hmm. and not just kind of like say, here it is, here's the standard, go figure it out. But I mean, education material, tutorials and, and tools that make it even easier. And then to me, the thing that I think I hit on briefly, but does feel like th there's something there with how do we break down the the line between producer and consumer. You know, right now it's very much like publish out, you look to the federal agency, they put their science out, like the scientist makes the thing, you hope he fills out the thing to making it so more people are participating. And I think it's something we feel in open source software, like when you put something out, you're psyched to see the feedback and that inspires you more, you're psyched to see people collaborate with you and actually make your stuff better. And, and I think that creates this virtuous cycle and feedback loop. And yeah, I think you guys have hit on it, but like, like and I don't have the answer, but I think that, that to me is the thing that I think will eventually make this all work where it's not just like, oh, please like fund this and the resources are limited, but like what are we all working on together? And yeah, I think a lot of it comes back to the data and how do we actually like, work with the data, make the data available, make it accessible, and figure out these feedback loops where, yeah, it's easy to like take the NOAA data, combine it with the NASA data, and publish that somewhere. And like for the, the NASA researcher to see that and the NOAA researcher to see their data being used that inspires them to fill out metadata and to do these things because somebody's going to read it. Like I think filling out metadata is frustrating when you think that nobody's going to possibly read this, but when you know someone's going to look at that, it's going to make their job easier. So yeah, how do we get that kind of feedback loops of inspiration? The, um, when I was uh, talking with Sophia before about some of the efforts at USGS, I was impressed by 
uh, like open science efforts at USGS to, to engage with like uh, native tribes people to actually crowdsource data in uh, fishery areas. And, they get the, and I can tell you that they're not going to buy proprietary software to communicate that data back. So this community, just like it's done for the open street map community, really needs to be working with the open science community to make this stuff, uh, to make the efforts of citizens reach out into the, and, and have citizen scientists participate with the open science community. Uh, I want to ask about, um, uh, besides data sharing itself, so that, that kind of segues to where I wanted to go there. Um, we, we, we've talked about how the Phosphor G community and new standards and better software, et cetera, can help us get the data to people to solve problems. Besides uh, the data sharing aspect, do you see any other aspects of open science, particularly with geospatial, that you think could be benefited by working with open source software community? Paige, you want you, can you tackle that? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, as we've kind of mentioned, open science does mean different things to different people, and it has a pretty broad definition. Um, there actually is a federal definition of open science that stresses not only the sharing of data and the writing of open, open code and, and open results, um, but the process and practice of how we're doing our science. Um, I... I see all of these aspects as great ways to collaborate with, um, with the Phosphor-G community. Um, I see in many ways it, it, it's, um, it's funny while we're here saying, oh, how can the open science work with the um, community, work with the Phosphor-G community? I feel like they're very similar. They're maybe one community um, in many ways. Um, and maybe to what Chris was saying, I think that, you know, Maybe, I, you know, in some ways calling two different communities, maybe kind of artificially separating. We want more people kind of working together. Um, anyway, we have different backgrounds maybe, but um, so I think everything we've been talking about, we've talked about data sharing, we've talked about um, building open source software that can help with the data sharing, but can also help with um, the processing of the data, the getting to the results. Um, which is, you know, very important in, in science. Um, and I think the, um, I mean, you, you've kind of mentioned the citizen science mm -hmm. aspect, um, which I think is, is also quite important. NASA does a lot of, a lot of citizen science. Uh, and I think a lot of that is we recognize there are a lot of people interested in getting involved. Um, and that's a great way for us to, um, kind of put a priority on making sure we're using these open tools so that helps us as well. Um, let's see, I had a point that I was trying to get to and now I went in a roundabout minute. Well, I'll uh, let you, you can come back to it. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, no, I think, yeah. so, um, from what I can understand about the FOSS4G community, um, you know, I come from the scientific research I think there's a lot of that going on, but it's not specific to science research. Um, what the Phosphor-G community does with open street maps and things like this, I think it's a little bit more connected to um, you know, local governments and kind of um, you know, regional mapping and this kind of thing, which kind of is more grounded in these local communities that aren't necessarily um, in the research community. And I think that, to me, seems like a really fantastic uh, like partnership, um, where if we could maybe the, the kind of open science community um, can engage more with the phosphor G community to really make sure that the science results are really becoming um, are, are are actionable, are are actually being used in local governance in mitigation strategies. If we're talking about you know climate change and this kind of thing. Um, so again, this is maybe my, my personal take on what the Phosphor D community is um, and some of the, the differences that we could leverage. Um, but I, I see that as really one aspect that I think of open science more than data sharing. It's the um, that communication side of who, you know, that collaborate, open, open collaboration. Maybe that's what yeah. I see as really beneficial. Brian, you want to? Tackle that. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe try to in, say something, you know, 
provocative to get the blood flow in here a little bit. I, I think a, a lot of um, a lot of scientists working in climate or weather or hydrology or oceanography or whatever it may be don't self-identify as doing geospatial stuff. It's not part of the curriculum. It's not part of the training. Uh, and it's not really part of the, the culture. I mean, I did a, I did a PhD uh, in climate science from MIT. I, I graduated without knowing what a CRS is. Like, it's it just, it, it's a very different world. Um, those fields need what the geospatial community has, the, the technology and the tools. Um, but they think of their primary work as trying to understand the, the chemistry or the physics or the biology of some scientific process. And geospatial is just one aspect of that. So what that means um, for us, it, you know, now putting on the hat as a geospatial person is that, you know, if we try and center like the geospatial aspect as like the core thing that we're doing, it might not find those audiences and it might not have the impacts um, that we're, we're looking for. Um, but I think if we can bring in, integrate geospatial technology with those existing tools, existing technologies, and embed it, you know, a, as part of the, the data so that the scientists don't have to say, oh, I need to like do this extra step to be geospatial, mm -hmm. then we're going to go a lot farther. Um, and I'll, I'll add one more related point, which is for many of these scientific domains, you know, the time dimension uh, is very important and very hard as well, right? So there's a, whole, there's a whole world of data that's just about time series data and temporal data analysis. And here we've got spatial data, but really the scientific problems are all spatial temporal, right? And so I, I, I'm curious in hearing more about that time dimension as well, because it's a big uh, challenge for many of these climate and weather data sets. So, you know, weather data may not be very high spatial resolution. It looks very coarse compared to some image, imagery, but it's 30 minute, uh, you know, outputs for, for decades, right? So there's, it's large and, and complex in a, along a whole different dimension. So just, just a few thoughts about what work lies ahead in order to have those open science impacts. Yeah. Sadir, do you want to, I mean, you guys must work with other, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we talked about your work, you're attending other scientific conferences and stuff, but not geo conferences. What are, what are you thinking in terms of how this dialogue could happen? No, I, I think one thing I also would like to talk, mention about like, you know, it will be nice to have actually policy around how, how we make the, the you know, we, there is like a collaboration effort going on, right? But like, you know, it would be good to have some sort of policy around like how we support the community. Yeah. I think, right? Having a, and I don't know exactly like, you know, what that policy can be, but what I envision is like, you know, there is a policy that actually allows government to work with the community, right? But again, just having a policy is not enough. There need to be a funding mechanism available to support that work, right? To sustain, right? Because there are lots of lots of work that's built around the open source community, right? Mm -hmm. And especially like in the weather service, like you know, we like to use some of them, but like we are operational. We yeah. are not able to just take that and use it, right? Because we have, you know, like you know, we also have like a domain where uh, one one part of our uh, program works on the research. Another there is another program we call R2O, research to operation, right? So there is a processes in a place which makes the research data to operation, right? The same, I would love to see that like the same sort of collaboration effort with this community, where you know we can bring in some of those work built or some the tools, the solution that's built that can be used by us as well, right? But there need to be a sort of like a procedure and a look at the sort of the maturity level, how we can have that software to be integrated in our 
uh, in our use cases, right? So have to have some sort of like a authoritative force workflows that we can have on, but how, but for there, there need to be some sort of like, you know, overseeing policies and the procedure in a place that we can actually use of that, right? I, I think that that is one of the uh, things that I see is missing and will be really good to have in that way that will really help us as well as to grow together with this community. Yeah. Chris, you've actually gone through several of these, but you know, aside from the data sharing part, what, is, what other you know, collaboration or what, what you want to footstop on in terms of what the Foster G community could do to encourage mm -hmm. open science? Yeah, I mean, that, Ryan's points resonated with me, and I think just reiterate, like, yeah, the sort of humility, you know, like, that the, we need to not say spatial is special, and if only you would do things spatially, then all the problems would be solved, but kind of that meet users way more than halfway and kind of figure out how do we get geospatial so it's easy to use, so it's the path of least resistance, and, yeah, yeah kind of take that on, so. Yeah. Well, I think we have time for one closing thoughts from each of you. And I did want to, you know, like as we've gone through here, is there something that you've missed or whatever? So I'll, I'll start with Paige. And just, is there one other message that you want to make sure that, to leave this audience with or something that you wanted to, to make sure you got the point across today? Um, mostly, I want to encourage you all to keep doing what you're doing. Um, I think it's, it's great. I love, I love seeing so much in the open source space and the op open data, all, all, of, all of what we've been talking about. So yeah, I, I'll just encourage you to keep going. Ryan? I, I think my message would be, we're at a really great and exciting time to be working in this space. I think Chris's talk gave a great summary of all the progress that's happened on, particularly around file formats, cloud optimized file formats and standards. And I think, you know, we're good on file format. <laughs> like let's not, yes. let's not do any more. Like, <laughs> let, let's but, get to work. But, but now let's, <laughs> let, now let's build those engines that can work with those file formats and do amazing things with them. And you know, visualization is one application, but large scale, planetary scale compute uh, and uh, analytics and machine learning is I think where we're gonna go. So I'm really excited to see what everyone is building and what we're gonna build. And um, I think we're about to enter a golden age basically for geospatial data in the cloud. Great. So the Eric, closing thought? Yeah, so just to recap again, you know, I, I can't say enough what like, you know, Ryan Page and then if we talked about like, yes, we are in the, that phase, right? We actually, in my program, I'm so excited that, you know, now we're actually, you know, making some of our data a lot more available in a way that's uh, chunked, right? Because like, you know, we talked about like, you know, some of the geospatial and time series, right? Our users want both. And we're still trying to figure this thing out, right? We don't know, like all of you, you know, I have worked with the, uh, some of this community to know like what my chunking size is going to be, what my chunking schema is going to be, I don't know, right? So what I'm looking at you here in this community is to help us as well, right? I, I know there is, and that's why I was talking about like having the right policy, but also I want to see a forged collaboration and maybe we find some opportunity that Phos4G can actually help us reach those, build that collaborative platform with this community, right? But I would like to see like, you know, some of the cool stuff that you're doing that I don't know, right? We don't have all the resource, but we can use your help, right? I, I think that's what I see, like there's an opportunity for us to work together and use all the capabilities that we have around and how, let's, help us to help you as well so that we can serve our American public. I think that that's, that's the goal I'm looking at. I'm very excited uh, what, uh, with this opportunity to actually talk and share what we have right now. But this is a lot for me to learn rather than like actually give it to this large community, actually. I'm here to learn. Thanks, Dick. And Chris, you had to start. You want to write recap? Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, Brian's points resonate with me. No more data formats. Uh, <laughs> 
I'm done with that phase of my career. Uh, the, uh, I think the, the next step for me is, yeah, get all the data in these formats. Like, I mean, it's pretty simple, but like, and, and it's less sexy work, but that's like literally what I've started to do is just converting things and uploading them. And I think that gets this kind of wheel turning. Um, I think the two things that become real interesting are, are data schemas, like how do we go not just the format level, but uh, everybody publishing buildings with the same attributes and be able to have those data sets grow. And then within that, I think IDs and getting to global IDs are, those to me are the next frontiers of make it so everyone could just publish data and it's interoperable and we're not doing it schema mapping on the fly, but just starting to coalesce the data in common ways and publish it in common ways. Um, so yeah, that's my closing more technical thought. Well, I want to thank all four of you. And um, I also want to thank Sophia, who wasn't able to be here, but did contribute mightily to all the questions. Really appreciate the discussion. Um, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to, um, before uh, before I introduce Paul and, and we have our final keynote, I want to uh, take a moment to thank um, the Foster G North America Organizing Committee for what's been a really, really great event. I especially want to, I probably am going to miss somebody, but I especially want to start out thanking Guido Stein um, for his leadership and work and all this. And Guido, really appreciate it. Um, so much work, I, I, and I would like, if people who are on the committee at the end of Paul's keynote, if you want to come down here, we'll do a group photo. Um, I want to, uh, other people, the, the committee has been so great. Michelle Tobias, our community lead and, and social media outreach. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, Michael Turner uh, and Regina Obi. Regina was unfortunately unable to make it, and the, all the people on the program committee, uh, Ryan Burley, Bill Dollins uh, for the all the work on um, the committee and then on uh, sponsorship. Um, Doug Newcomb, uh, Mike Williams and Jill uh, Jillian Long on volunteering. It's just fantastic. Uh, Matt Hansen, Vicky Vergara for all your work on the committee and a great keynote. Randy Hale, Eric Parper, Laura Wood Miller, James Cloninger and the Motif team for all their help. Maggie Colley and the OSM uh, US team for their help. And of course, Project Geospatial for doing our uh, videography. And we will, the, this session will be recorded. All the plenaries were recorded. The government sessions were recorded. That Geo Day is recovered recorded and they're going to be available in the next couple of weeks. The Project Geospatial website will uh, have them there. So if you have any trouble, just reach out and we'll get it. Okay, so I'm going to just, um, and I don't think I missed anybody, I'm sure. Oh, and thank you for the Delaney event staff, uh, Caitlin and Cindy, just fantastic work. That was really nice. And to all of our speakers, I mean, Thanks to all of you. I mean, you are all the speakers and, and Vicki, I think you did a, such a great job saying it's just us. You know, there's no big corporation or whatever. It's just us, you, your programs uh, have been so wonderful. So our closing keynote is gonna be by Paul Ramsey. Paul, many of you know, uh, was co-founder of the Postages uh, Project in 2001. He's been so active in these uh, in the Phosphor G community as a speaker, as a leader. Uh, he's a senior geospatial engineer at Crunchy Data working with uh, some of the thorniest geospatial problems around. And it's really a privilege to have Paul uh, close out Foster G North America 2023 as our uh, closing keynote. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> okay, I was asked the organizing committee what you guys were all in, interested in hearing and Self-righteous moralizing, <laughs> will, that, will that fit the bill? Because that's all I got, that's all I got. Um, yeah, so before we get started, uh, excuse me, there's one little formality. Um, 
Permission is hereby granted free of charge to any person obtaining a copy of this keynote to deal in the keynote without restriction, including without limitation the rights to use, copy, modify, merge, publish, distribute, sublicense, and or sell copies of the keynote, and to permit persons to whom the keynote is furnished to do so. Uh, this, this keynote is provided as is. <laughs> without warranty of any kind, express or implied, including but not limited warranties of merchantability, fitness uh, for a particular purpose or non-infringement. In no event shall the author be liable for any claim, damages, or other liability, whether in an action of contract, tort, or otherwise, arising from, out of, or in connection with the keynote, or the use or other dealings with the keynote. Uh, got it? <laughs> Uh, these are the terms of MIT No Attribution Open Source License, and just to be perfectly clear, I owe you all nothing. <laughs> and in return, reciprocally, you all owe me nothing. Uh, you do not have to pay me, not a lot, not a little. Uh, you can do whatever you want with this keynote. So here's a question. What value does it have? I am giving this keynote to you in exchange for nothing. So by basic economic principles, it must have no value. Um, at least if I am an economically rational self-maximizing entity of the sort our society is presumed to run upon. Um, and you also are rational, rational self-maximizing entities. Uh, then it must have no value, but um, am I a rational? self-maximizing entity? Are you? Like, why are we here? We rational self-maximizing entities in a room all discussing worthless software <laughs> with people to whom we owe nothing at all. Like, clearly there is something missing in a classic microeconomic distillation of the open source phenomenon. Uh, the most obvious missing piece in the reductive economic approach is society relationships, uh, non-monetary obligation, purpose, all the things that make us human. The other thing missing in this strange tale of worthless software, worthless valuable software, is that since the dawn of the free software era, this valuable worthless software has continued to evolve and grow and multiply in apparent defiance of the basic laws of economics. And I have a talk, half, half talk, written back on my desk about the morality of open source, but because of this strange paradox of worthless, valuable software that grows and develops and outcompetes the alternatives, yet is controlled by no one and free to all, uh, because of this, I keep coming back helplessly to the topic of money. Money, 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 money. I mean, yes, uh, I like building open source for the engagement with the community and for the sense of purpose from seeing the software used all over the world, for enabling people who might otherwise never have the tools. And I like using open source for the flexibility, uh, the way it's developed from a perspective of user needs, not corporate monetization. And I like feeling useful, uh, knowing that my work has, been, has enabled other people to build and create things they might otherwise not have made. But, but also, um, I like buying groceries, and I have a crippling addiction to cafe lattes. I enjoy taking a hot shower from time to time and being out of the rain. And in this, I am not alone. Uh, there is a tension inherent in the core legal promise of open source. You owe me nothing. I would like to eat. And notwithstanding all that, being owed nothing, I'm clearly not starving. Um, I'm not even hungry. And, and that requires some explanation. So let me share two equally true facts about open source. Um, first, people are making an awful lot of money from open source software, myself included. And second, people are making basically no money at all from open source software, uh, myself included. So, so how do I manage this trick, making a lot of money and making basically no money at all? Um, so there are a number of people like me whose salaries are paid by companies and institutions who want them to do nothing but wake up every day and make open source projects better and faster and stronger. Uh, one of these people is Linus Torvalds, uh, who created Linux 
and now works a, a very comfortable job for the Linux Foundation, which pays him handsomely, and in turn is supported with very significant donations from the largest companies in the world. So is Linus Torvalds making a lot of money from open source or a little? Well, Linus Torvalds is not the only person to create a world-changing operating system that completely reconfigures the technology industry. There's this other guy, too. Like Bill Gates managed that trick, too, about 15 years earlier, and he's about 10,000 times richer. Uh, relatively speaking, Linus Torvalds created the foundational technology of our cloud computing infrastructure and managed to make basically no money at all. What's up with that? Well, the problem, the problem, if there is one, is that Linus Torvalds decided to work in the open and allow anyone else to use his source code for anything they wanted without restriction. And as a result, his software got more useful to more people more quickly than anything that Microsoft ever sold. It's just that the good part of the open source, the freedom, is not consistent with forcefully extracting fat stacks of dollars from the economy. And, and the Free Software Foundation has some bracing words about the virtue of software freedom um, in contrast to other development models. Uh, they say, there is nothing wrong with wanting pay for work or seeking to maximize one's income as long as one does not use means that are destructive. But the means customary in the field of software today are based on destruction. Extracting money from the users of a program by restricting their use of it is destructive because the restrictions reduce the amount and the ways that the program can be used. This reduces the amount of wealth that humanity derives from the program. The Free Software Foundation very much does not consider Bill Gates to be a good citizen, notwithstanding the malaria fighting and polo fighting and the climate researching and all the other good stuff that he's funded since his original sins. Back in 1986, um, at the dawn of free software, Byte Magazine uh, interviewed Richard Stallman, the, at that point, undisgraced founder of the Free Software Foundation. And, uh, and I found this part really interesting. Um, Byte asks, a cynic might wonder how you earn your living. And Stallman answers, from consulting. When I do consulting, I always reserve the right to give away what I wrote for the consulting job. Also, I could be making my living by mailing copies of free software that I wrote and some that other people wrote. But as long as I can go on making a living by consulting, I think that's the best way. And then by being curious, people ask, um, what is, what is uh, currently uh, included? I oh, lost my place. What is currently included in the official GNU dist distribution tape? And Stallman answers, uh, right now, <laughs> the tape contains GNU Emacs, Bison, MIT Scheme, and Hack. Now, before I go on, I want you to imagine mailing away money uh, $400 in today's money to MIT and getting back in return a magnetic tape containing Emacs, Bison, Scheme, and Hack. Close your eyes and luxuriate, right, in the idea of a computing environment so simple and pristine, but at the same time so empty and lonely that a tape copy of these weird bits and bobs is worth taking the time to mail away for. Ah, simpler times. Anyways, we live in the present, and from the original profit of free software, we get the following modes of making a living while not engaging in IP licensing or restricting the uses people can put software to. Consulting and mailing magnetic tapes around. Uh, so first, consulting. Uh, this, is, this is a huge one, and almost nobody talks about it much. But the simple expedient of holding knowledge in your head about a niche topic like a piece of open source software, and then selling access to that knowledge in the form of an hourly fee. This is really the whole game. Um, if I got laid off by crunchy data tomorrow, and I sincerely hope I do not, uh, the very next day I would be hanging up a shingle saying, come rent my knowledge of Postgres and Postgres and web mapping technology. Um, consulting really is the perfect match for open source software since there is no real barrier to entry. You find a piece of software that turns your crank you build up expertise in it, and then something, 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 something. Profit. Um, like so for a new project or a small project, consulting is usually the only way for the project to capture value. Like the life cycle of most open source projects is to start very small with a developer or user base of one, the developer is solving their own problem. 
Not just a developer is very, very lucky and very good. They can build that initial seed up to a small community of users and maybe some other contributors. Uh, with even more luck, that community will bring the project into use at some institution somewhere that is willing to pay some money for some work. And at that point, according to the 2023 Tidelift Open Source Maintainer Survey, at that point they will join the 36% of open source developers who earn more than zero dollars from their work, although they will probably not join the 13% who earn most of their income from open source work. A number of the projects in our own ecosystem are developed largely on a consulting basis. GDAL, the ubiquitous image handling library, PDAL, the library handling library, QGIS, to a shocking degree, frankly, for a project of such size and influence, QGIS has developers earning livings through consulting. You can hear, perhaps, in my voice, a certain reticence about celebrating the consulting model. Uh, consulting can happen around projects of all sizes, of all maturities. It doesn't require startup funds or any particular organizational scale. Um, so you like, almost think like, is consulting the magic bullet? <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, no, it's a foundational piece uh, and to note that people with expertise can leverage that expertise into services revenue, but it has some serious issues when it comes to maintaining large pieces of critical software infrastructure. Um, first, the kind of business that consulting generates tends to be new features oriented. This is maybe fine when the software is new and growing for exploring capabilities, but as the software matures, it can lead to features that are built and then abandoned and to a lack of focus on the kinds of things that customers don't want to pay for. Um, things like continuous integration, code modernization, platform support, packaging, documentation, all the things that add resilience and stability to software and community. Consulting can build projects that are large, but often fails to build projects that are strong. Uh, second, the intermittent nature of consulting can easily burn out contributors. Uh, I know quite a few people who ended up leaving open source work in favor of corporate stability. The project is not well served when the maintainers are living a precarious existence. They'll take on jobs that are bad for the project just for the money, or they'll just leave. And the project will risk abandonment if another maintainer does not come along. So, so what's the answer? Um, clearly, in an ideal world, there would be organizations that can consolidate the value that the world is getting from free and open source software and use that money to hire maintainers on a full-time basis at industry competitive wages. And that brings us to um, Richard Stallman's second source of free software income, selling those magnetic tapes, which as it happens is a specific example of distribution. When Stallman sold his funky tape uh, full of GNU program utilities, he was to some extent supporting his software development work since he worked on many of those projects. So in that respect, distribution was a revenue model that was feeding the underlying projects. But distribution revenue isn't restricted to just the people who work on the software. Free software is free. It's free to copy, free to change, free to do anything you want with, so distribution revenue won't necessarily go to people who are good at free software development. It will go to people who are good at distribution. Dun, dun, dun. So when I was installing Linux on my computers back in the late 90s, I would get a copy of the latest version of Red Hat by mailing an outfit um, called Walnut Creek Software, who would ship me a little stack of CD-ROMs. And this money, was collected by Walnut Creek for the service of collating the software, burning it to a disk, and mailing it to me. Red Hat Linux, the business that actually built the distribution, compiling all the parts, integrating and testing the full operating system, they got nothing. And the thousands of people who actually wrote the software, the libraries, utilities, the very kernel that Linus Torvalds was working on, unpaid as a finished graduate student at the time, got nothing. Distribution is an incredibly powerful choke point in the software economy because it is the place where convenience can be converted into dollars at the highest rate. And convenience is one of the few things that open source consumers will pay for. Before I get deep into distribution, I wanna, I wanna go back, uh, roll back to my rosy vision of organizations creating value around open source and using that income to pay for open source maintenance because I work for an organization like that. 
Uh, they are not just a theoretical construct or wishful thinking. Uh, there is a thing called a professional open source support company. Crunchy Data is a professional open source support company. Red Hat is also a professional open source support company. How does this work? Uh, what is the value that such companies provide? Why is it worth money? Uh, my favorite explanation of this model comes from a guy named James Dixon from Petaho, and he calls it the beekeeper model. Um, basically, the idea is that open source developers are kind of like bees. Um, they get together and they produce this wonderful, tasty honey, which you would love to eat, right? Um, but they also have this kind of alien culture that you don't understand. Um, and if you annoy them, they might sting you. <laughs> uh, particularly for big, stodgy enterprises with lots of internal rules and procedures, interacting directly with an open source community is like trying to get honey in your tea by reaching your hand directly into a hive. Right? It is not going to end well. Um, what the stodgy enterprises need is an organization to mediate the relationship between the big stodgy end user organization and the freewheeling, weird, and potentially painful free software community. And the insight here is that there is a lot of value in this mediating role. There are things that a company that is alert to the needs of its clients can do, things that communities never will. One of the things that Crunchy Data did early in its existence, selling Postgres support into the US federal government, is to write a STIG for Postgres. Do you know what a STIG is? Yeah, there's some people nodding. Um, it is an unfathomably boring document um, that walks you step by step on how to configure the software in a secure way. And only if your software has a STIG that you have followed will be it approved for development or for deployment on government systems. Uh, every single component of a big government system from the OS to the database to the web servers will have an associated STIG document. And believe me, there is no way I will ever write one unless someone backs up a huge dump truck of money in front of me. Uh, incidentally, there's also a thing called common criteria certification that requires us to review every single commit made to the code base. And in order to maintain Crunchy's common criteria certification of PostGIS, I regularly review every single commit to the PostGIS code base. It is not fun, <laughs> but it's my job and it creates value for some of our customers. Uh, so, so there's a model. There's a model that aggregates money from large institutional users of open source software, sufficient to pay full-time developers to continue the development and maintenance of free software. The professional open source support company. Problem solved? Eh, not really. Uh, like the consulting model, there's some serious deficiencies to this model. So, I mean, first, have a look at some of the companies that have made this model work. Red Hat Linux, SUSE Linux, uh, in the Linux space, Crunchy Data, EDB, in the Postgres space. What they have in common is supporting fairly low level infrastructural components and supporting their operations. Basically, people don't pay for support until they go to production, and they only pay for production support for systems that are mission critical. So Linux only became a product that occasioned enterprise support when enterprises actually started running mission critical workloads on it, which was really quite recently, like as these things go. So, so this is all well and good for infrastructural software, but it doesn't do much for front-end tooling, doesn't do much for data science, user-facing desktop software like QGIS. The professional support model found a niche, and a good niche in mission-critical production deployment, but not much more. Um, I'm gonna skip over to monetization models, um, dual licensing and open core, because I think they are fundamentally broken in that they are just tweaks on proprietary licensing of intellectual property. Like the long run trajectory of these models is toward corporate control, not community expansion. Like for example, here is a partial, partial, partial list of well-known open core companies that no longer distribute their software under open source. Why? They're all profitable, but none of them presumably was profitable enough for the venture capital boards. So they dumped their open source licensing. Um, so I really don't think that relicensing or open core are gonna be the most important future models for building value around open source. The model I do think important um, and will stay important for the next 10 years is open source in the cloud. Open source on the cloud, I mean, it's just another twist on distribution as a locus of value extraction. Just like the CD-ROM, it's the software company that mailed me CD-ROMs, uh, the cloud providers can sit at the choke point of convenience and charge money for open source, 
while the open source communities behind that choke point very often receive nothing. They are not required to support the communities, and by and large, until quite recently, they mostly haven't. And this is entirely their right, although it's not super smart, since it starves the very projects that they're monetizing. Uh, it's not difficult to put hard numbers on the amount of money that cloud providers are extracting from the value of open source software. And this is an example around Postgres, but you can build it around other things. Uh, you can rent an AWS T3 2x large instance running Linux for 33.28 cents per hour. You can rent that same instance as an RDS database instance running Postgres, and AWS will charge you 57.9 cents per hour. So the Postgres premium that AWS is charging and putting directly into its pocket is 24.6 cents per hour. That's real money. Like, that's almost half the cost. Many, many millions of dollars that AWS is receiving directly for running open source software on its infrastructure. And the open source deal, where they owe the authors nothing, that deal is working out real well for them. Um, I first made this point publicly at a talk uh, at Foster G North America in 2019, and, and some people at AWS, they got, they got a little prickly about it. Uh, they said, there's a false equivalence in that slide. Using RDS is not the same as launching EC2 and downloading a database engine. It provides many additional features. Okay, fair point. Um, in slicing up the total value of the AWS offering of the server and the database, I missed a slice, right, the AWS management backplane. So I wondered, like, how much was that backplane worth? So I asked, how much of the value over and above bare EC2 would you say AWS, the AWS part of RDS is providing? 10%, 20%, 50%, 80%? To which he replied, I don't know the answer to that. It depends on what it would cost a specific customer to build and operate those capabilities. <laughs> which made me a little mad, right? The implication is that all the money that customers are paying for RDS is for the server in the backplane. That's the only thing of value in the offering, the only thing customers are paying for, which is completely, completely infuriating, right? And also, well, correct? <laughs> Customers have the option of running manually assembled EC2 post Postgres combinations, and they largely don't. They pay the premium for RDS. Ergo, the premium must be entirely the management backplane. That sucks, <laughs> right? And it still doesn't seem fair. The backplane's worthless without the database. But AWS not only takes the money, they also somehow manage to take the credit. Two, they provide value worth paying for. The Postgres open source community somehow does not. If this were the whole story on the cloud, which is gonna be the preeminent purveyor of open source for the next generation, this would be very, very bad news indeed. Um, but the news is not all bad. Now, I pointed out earlier that Red Hat Linux uh, employs Linux experts to work on the software to backstop their claimed ability to support the software for enterprises. Like this is the same promise Crunchy makes for Postgres and Postgres. It's why we employ Tom Lane and Stephen Frost and other longtime Postgres experts, and also me and Martin Davis on the spatial side. It's not too much of a reach to imagine a world in which the cloud providers need to employ contributors to the projects they spin to demonstrate their ability to support the software they're running for corporations and governments and other serious organizations in the world. Back in 2019, when I first rolled out my AWS premium argument, I pointed out that at that point, AWS employed exactly one of 28 active Postgres contributors, which was frankly one more than I thought they employed. That seemed like a travesty, given the amount of value they were extracting from the software. Uh, that is also, Four years later, here in 2023, no longer true. Um, AWS employs a number of committers and community members. Similarly, Azure employs a number of active contributors. Ironically, Google, which was a very early corporate proponent of open source, um, really lags the field of the big three in this particular metric. If you poke around major infrastructural open source projects that are spun in the clouds now, it's pretty common to find major contributors who are also cloud employees. It seems like Finally, 
the big clouds, big tech, big corporate users of open source in general are slowly coming to terms with the fact that if they do not directly support some open source development, the goose that lays the golden eggs won't survive. Or even worse, it will survive as a zombie goose that lays occasional eggs of shit. <laughs> in 2014, the Heartbleed bug in OpenSSL opened up every secure service on the web to zero day remote access exploits. It was a big deal. They wrote about it in the newspaper. <laughs> it cost the big providers millions to remediate, and it was caused by a very small ch change in the OpenSSL library that was introduced because the maintainer of OpenSSL, and there was only one full-time maintainer at that point, was overworked, underpaid, and making what money he did through the venerable activity of consulting. He had paid contracts to add features, but maintenance was done on his own time. Mistakes were made. And afterwards, the big cloud providers got together and created the Core Infrastructure Initiative, which is basically a big pot of money they direct to projects that need sustainability funding. It's a very self-interested initiative, um, but that's in many ways a good thing. If big companies are finally starting to realize that it is in their self-interest to fund development that is not necessarily immediately monetizable. That money spent today on open source maintenance will save money tomorrow in higher reliability, security, and quality. At least, maybe they're realizing that, maybe not. Um, back in our own world of geospatial, you have all probably heard about the GDAL project. Um, the GDAL project is a library and set of command line tools that allow you to read and write any of dozens of imagery formats and to apply common transformations to that imagery, resampling, reprojecting, masking, color mapping, even contouring or applying kernel features to the rasters. You can use GDAL on its own inside scripting languages. You can use it inside QGIS, inside PostGIS, inside Google Earth, anywhere geospatial images and rasters show up. And over the last 10 years, the default place for large imagery collectors to dump their imagery has been the cloud. And the tool they use to do processing of that data, both before storing it and after, is usually GDAL, or a scripting language like Python wrapped around GDAL. There's really no alternative technology. GDAL either works well, or the trains stop running. So, who's getting business value from GDAL? Well, <laughs> thousands of people on an individual basis, folks here, but on an aggregate organizational basis, the big imagery creators and the cloud providers whose storage is only useful because GDAL can access their imagery directly and efficiently. And so one of the most positive and most surprising developments in open source funding the last few years happened when the GDAL project was able to fundraise over a quarter million dollars in recurring funding from big cloud companies, big satellite imagery companies, and big space companies. Not funding for feature development, not consulting work, but funding for specific or non-specific maintenance and core enhancements. Big companies were finally supporting the infrastructure they run on. Uh, the GDAL project used an existing nonprofit, non NumFocus, as the banker to invoice the sponsors and manage the account. And that GDAL money was used to support 50% of core developer Evan Rowell's time, and he still made the other half doing normal open source consulting. Some of the funds were spent to maintain libraries that GDAL depends on, even further upstream. The GEOS project, for example, is used by GDAL for computational geometry support. GEOS got funding from GDAL for six months of core maintenance work, which has resulted in a cleaner, faster, more future-friendly code base. I gave a shorter version of this talk, like just six months ago, and I concluded, I was done, whoop, that maybe finally things are getting better. Yes, the clouds are creaming off most of the monetary benefit of open source, but they were starting to feed back into these communities by hiring core contributors and incubating new contributors and their staffs by doing sponsorships. And the GDAL example seemed like a wonderful one in which the major corporations shared the burden via sponsorship. No one company, not even a really huge dedicated imagery company, needs to hire a full-time GDAL developer. But in aggregate, altogether, they could each purchase 20% of a GDAL developer. So yeah, my internal unicorn was jumping over rainbows. And then, and then, uh, this spring, NumFocus started calling around the sponsors for renewals. And one after one, after the whole year of sponsorship, the big corporations all started dropping off. AWS, Maxar, Planet, 
Now, Planet had had a round of layoffs this summer, it's losing money, that's fine. Okay, life comes at you fast. But AWS, <laughs> AWS pulled in first quarter revenue of $21 billion last year, first quarter, with 25% gross margins. Uh, this is very much a live situation. Um, the GDAL team called their contacts in AWS and Max Iron Planet, and the message coming back was generally that management didn't see the business case for the sponsorship. Now, the business case had been made the previous year. That's how the sponsorship was in place. But the internal context had to make the case all over again. So as of the moment I'm writing this, um, AWS, AWS has restored their full sponsorship. Maxar has restored a smaller one. Planet is still deciding. Microsoft and Esri are both hanging in there as sponsored. Um, while it's great that the GDAL funding is still mostly in place, things have gotten better again, it's maybe questioned the core premise of the effort. And the core premise is that corporations could ever fully appreciate the operational importance of supporting the open source software they leverage value out of. The individuals, the people we talk about, talk to inside the companies, they get it. They understand, they convey the message upward, but the organization itself is constantly thermostatically returning to the plain fact that with open source, it says right on the package, they own nothing. And our allies in these corporations, they have lives and careers. They won't be in the corporation forever. They won't be willing to spend reputational capital on the effort forever. This would be the moment for someone in the audience to stand up and yell, corporations are just maximizing shareholder value. Corporations are just maximizing shareholder value. <laughs> I can't see that. And, and my answer, <laughs> my answer would be, you know, I'm 52 years old, so I'm a young man, but that's still just old enough to remember that maximizing shareholder value was once a new idea. Um, that there used to be a different rule. As recently as 1980, managing to maximize value over a number of stakeholder groups. Shareholders, yes, but also employees, customers, suppliers, and local community. That was considered the corporate management best practice. There's nothing special about the way things are done now, except they happen to be the way things are done now. I talked earlier about Linus Torvalds and Bill Gates and the huge disparity in the amount of value they captured for themselves and their families. A few millions for Torvalds, hundreds of billions for Gates. So, big win for personal avarice, right? Except, why do we stop counting once we've totted up how much money these men have personally extracted from the economy? For example, the first Google production, or Google production rack was built with a mix of proprietary Sun hardware and Linux servers. Google quickly became and remains a 100% Linux-based company. Imagine if they had had to buy all their servers from Sun. How much additional Linux created value resides in the pockets of Sergey Brin and Larry Page? Similarly, Facebook was started with MySQL and PHP running on Linux servers. Thanks, Mark. Um, <laughs> big chunks of it still use that stack. Like in a counterfactual world where Windows was the only operating system, how does Facebook grow to be as valuable as Microsoft? How much of that Facebook value is Linux and PHP and MySQL value? Economists have a word for the things they cannot account for in their models of the world. They call them externalities. And the usual example is factories dumping waste into public rivers, converting the cost of dealing with pollution from a private expense to a public expense. And it goes largely unremarked, but the whole internet economy of the past 20 years has been the beneficiary of a massive externality in the acquiring of service systems that in the ordinary course of affairs would have been hugely expensive. Operating systems, databases, language, development tools, all obtained for zero dollars in capital investment. Google, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Airbnb, GitHub, the pretty much every billion dollar startup has been constructed through the slapping together of a vast collection of open source software components. Now these have been immensely clever collections of software components combined with deft market making and messaging, so credit where credit is due. But remember, 
No matter how clever the brick builder is, he is not going to be able to build much of a house without bricks. So let's update our evaluation of Bill Gates and Linus Torvalds. How does our evaluation of these two extraordinarily consequential innovators change? If instead of asking ourselves how much value they captured in the market, we instead ask ourselves how much value they created for society. It's a very different valuation, isn't it? On that metric, Linus Torvalds' social capital is just as impressive as Bill Gates. And why would we care you know, how much value they created? Because we live in a society, and we all share in that created value in a way we do not necessarily share in that market-captured value. As a society, we already recognize that markets are bad at solving certain kinds of problems. Here's a thought experiment. What would the interstate highway system look like if it was built and maintained entirely by a voluntary consortium of trucking companies? <laughs> like, pretty bad, pretty bad, right? And yet this is the model. This is the model we continue to apply to the digital infrastructure that runs our economy. The gravel and cement and asphalt of the 21st century are libraries and languages and operating systems that are currently being maintained by voluntary consortia of their users. So on the one hand, here we are, economically rational entities, satisfied users of all this software that our economy values at nothing. Something is working. Why argue with success? On the other hand, even the single most foundational project, the most successful project in the whole open source world, Linux, is having problems that would be completely familiar to the maintainers of GDAL or any of the other small geospatial libraries. This article, uh, long-term support for Linux kernel to be cut as maintenance remains under strain. This article showed up in my news feed literally while I was writing this speech. And it is a testament to the success of the status quo. Um, there are 2,000 developers involved in Linux, many of them full-time employees of a wide range of corporations. That is a huge success. But like, just like any other consulting company, these corporate customers, these corporate employers of Linux developers are paying for them to add features while expecting the community work of project maintenance to happen for free in their spare time. So Joseph Bachik, Linux kernel file system developer and maintainer, maintainers are burning out because maintainers don't scale. Derek Wong, another senior, senior Linux administrator, kernel maintainer, this cannot stand. We need help. What the Linux maintainers are dealing with, what you can hear other maintainers complain about, what you can get me to complain about with very little prompting, <laughs> this is the open source bargain. And it looks on the surface to be a very poor bargain indeed. You will get very little money for changing the world. But the reverse is also true, and it is so, 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 so very important. You can change the world for very little money. The very thing that makes it hard for open source to capture value the freedoms granted by the license allows open source to create immense amounts of value because there is nothing stopping anyone from using it for anything, anywhere. That leverage is so large that relatively small contributions can have huge effects. And as a result, there's truly no organization too small to make a big impact in the open source world. Um, because we're here in the DC metro area, I am sure there are a lot of civil servants in the room, civil servants, yeah. It's here for civil service, which is great. Um, in an only very slightly different alternate universe, I would be a British Columbia civil servant. Um, I was one for a short time early in my career, and I appreciated the sense of public spirit and purpose. Um, my friend uh, and professional mentor, Mark Sondheim, was a civil servant in the British Columbia government. He died earlier this year at the age of 70. You have probably not heard of him before. He never progressed any higher than a program manager. He never managed an annual budget of more than a few million dollars. And yet I can almost guarantee you that everyone, everyone in this room uses software that he brought into being and kept vital. 
Post just came into being in 2001 in my small geospatial consulting company. The very first production post just system stored 1.5 million records of the British Columbia Digital Road Atlas. This is a program that Mark managed. In addition to giving us his early vote of confidence, letting us use post just for his program, Mark let us devote part of our Digital Roads contract budget to maintenance and development of post just just as companies can charge money for activities that are adjacent to open source software, consulting or standards or certification or support or distribution, so too government can spend money via open source adjacent projects on open source maintenance and development. What made Mark really unique though as a civil servant was his desire to innovate from within government and in later years to multiply the impact of that innovation using open source licensing. So I won't talk about his early projects, which predated the free software era, but I will talk about his greatest successes, JTS and GIOS. Uh, in the late 90s, Mark was frustrated that every piece of GIS processing seemed to be tied to a GIS system. And it was clear that Geospatial was moving beyond the desktop, but the whole industry was still slave to the desktop model and, and worse to desktop pricing. He dreamed of GIS without the GIS. And that was, that was a big dream in the late 90s, but he had a long-term plan. And that started with a computational geometry library, a foundational library to define the core geometry objects and the basic operations on those objects. And the OpenGIS Simple Features Standard provided the design template. Now Mark got $250,000 from a federal government innovation fund and he contracted a local company to build this library. And in the contract, he specified two things. First, that the copyright would be held by the company, not the queen. And second, that the software would be re released under an open source license. Now the first requirement ensured the government didn't lock up the software in an intellectual property office. And the second requirement ensured that the company didn't do basically the same thing. The result, was the JTS topology suite, the Java topology suite, which you'll find in GeoServer and GeoTools and any other spatial software in Java. JTS was translated into C++ and connected to PostGIS by my company a few months after JTS was first released. That C++ port is called GIOS, and you'll find it in PostGIS and GDAL and QGIS, Shapely, really any other C or C++-based open software. You'll also find JavaScript ports in your web maps, you'll find Golang ports and Rust ports and so on. It is truly a foundational piece of infrastructure and it only exists because of the innovative spirit of a single British Columbia civil servant. Just as we've forgotten that corporations used to care more about, shell, more, about more than shareholder value, we've forgotten the government used to consider itself a source of innovation. And not derivative value capturing innovation, like the cell phone taxi service or the hotel in your house service, but foundational value creating innovation. Who created the basic research that led to electronic computing? The army. Who was the first customer for the integrated circuit? The air force. Who built the first internet works and brought the first routers? DARPA. Where is the World Wide Web invited, invented? CERN. Where was the first graphical web browser developed? The University of Illinois. Who built GRASS, GIS? The US Army Corps of Engineers. And why is there still an active research and open community around GRASS? Because someone in the Corps, I'd love to know the story, someone in the Corps had the smarts to open source it in 1999. Government and civil servants can develop and seed new innovations and lay down infrastructure that will be used for decades to come. It doesn't even take a great deal of money. It just takes the vision to look a little distance over the horizon. Over the horizon, I hope, is a new status quo in which we get beyond the minimalist open source obligations. Sure, I owe you nothing. You owe me nothing. Those are the rules. But beyond the rules, there is the context. We do, in fact, depend on each other. We do live in a society. So what can we be doing in the complicated and intransigent present to make this society better? We all have our roles and we all have our context. What can we do now? Open source developers and maintainers. They need to recognize that money can be surprisingly hard to move and they need to be proactive to build the channels for money to flow for them. 
Like no amount of goodwill in the world will help fund open source maintenance if the channels are not there for the money to flow. Yes, we have consulting, we have professional open source companies, we have sponsorship programs, we have GitHub sponsorships and Patreon, we still need more. Uh, one of the key success factors of the GDO maintenance fund was bringing NumFocus, an existing organization with financial controls and full-time staff to handle the logistics of moving money, bringing NumFocus into the picture. It made working with the large corporations way easier. But even so, that's not enough because the sponsorship model doesn't work for the broader public sector. Governments are mostly not allowed to do sponsorship. We need to do better. Open source maintainers also need to keep innovating on models to monetize their value add. The primary value add developers have above raw software is their human capital, their knowledge and their social connections to other developers. How do we monetize that? Mostly we give it away. We give it away on message boards and at conferences like this one. The most common monetization strategy is the one I've used for the last 10 years, just work directly for a company willing to pay for that open source human capital. But that doesn't work for many organizations that can't afford to hire one whole human. Um, my colleague Howard Butler at Hobu has been experimenting with a new model lately of providing fractional development support for Petal, uh, delivered live via Slack. It's a novel approach. It opens up another channel for the money to flow in increments smaller than a whole developer without tying the money to new feature development. We need more business innovation of this sort. Open source development is a partner between users and developers. And developers, we need to do our part. And one of the big surprises I've found, particularly after giving a speech like this, one of the big surprises I've found around open source and money is how frequently organizations are willing to fund. It's like, oh, you need money? Boy, we can get you money. Once they know there's an administratively simple way to move the money, it's about moving it. It's not about having it or even having the will to spend it. It's about opening up the mechanisms to move it. The private sector uses open source. They need to step up to the funding channels that already exist. There's already lots of mechanisms for project sponsorships and for micro donations via GitHub and Patreon. These mechanisms are mostly ignored by corporate users, but they shouldn't be because to ignore them is to build castles of software on foundations of sand. A recent change I've noticed is that large software organizations um, are carefully mapping out their software dependency chains for legal and licensing purposes. Uh, the EU CRA, that's probably going to result in even more of this so-called supply chain, software supply chain mapping. These maps should be used not just as compliance tools, not just as liability shields, they should be used as investment tools. These maps show you what software you depend on. So make sure that you keep it alive and healthy. What you do not water will not grow. For software organizations making money by monetizing open source, and naturally I'm staring aggressively at cloud vendors, they need to step up and directly fund and staff the maintenance of the software they spin and the critical dependencies of that software. These are big organizations. They know the dependency structure of their software. They have open source program offices. There is no excuse. They are doing better. The directionality is good. They need to do more still. Finally, the public sector. And I lay a lot at the feet of the public sector um, because it is the foundational institution of our society. And we are talking here about society building. If the public sector does not lead, the rest of society cannot be expected to follow. Do we truly believe that open source software is infrastructure? If we believe it, then the public sector should act like it is. Like in the short term, follow the example of my friend Mark. Be creative with funding vehicles already in your grasp. Insist contractually that your vendors work in the open, that they make them, make them deliver under open source licenses, managed in public, with complete documentation and reproducible builds. Pay a little more for good development practices. Break applications up into reusable, generic core components and the parts specific to you. Insist on reuse of common upstream libraries and pay for contributions to those libraries as a normalized part of development. Remember, modern software is not built with a million commits to one repository. It's built of work spread out across a huge collection of software that is then brought together to solve a problem. If your vendor is not working and frankly billing you to improve upstream libraries, then they are working against your interests 
and against society's long-term interests. Get rid of them. In the longer term, use the power of the purse. Um, cloud software is going to be required to submit bills and materials. Software chains of dependency. That is a roadmap to a requirement that some percentage of spend be spent on maintenance. No one should be selling software to government that they aren't also spending effort or dollars to maintain. Insist on smart ethical behavior from your vendors. This should become part of the standard contract templates, just as much as insurance clauses and security clauses already are. There's nothing mysterious about insisting on maintenance. It's just insisting on insurance. And it's what we expect from any other piece of public infrastructure. I started off this talk by telling you what you owe me, which is nothing, which is what I owe you. I do, however, have a debt to society, the society that has educated and supported me and kept me safe these 52 years. I owe it the care to do a good job, and I owe it enough future focus to ensure that the software I care for will survive me. You all owe society something too, depending on your context, your life condition, your purpose, and your skills. What do we owe each other? What we owe each other is everything we need. What we owe each other is everything we can afford to give. Thank you very much. I see what they say about the, oh, here we go. Now it's the party, it's only one chart. Um, hey everybody, I'm welcome you guys. I'm happy you guys are here to be a part of this panel. When we talk about FOSS4G and the federal agencies and why this is important, you know, I'm a little different than a lot of people in this room. I didn't grow up with the geospatial background. I came into NGA and then I learned all these things and learned a lot about this and became, I loved it and learned it. So this is important to me. And so we have a great panel. You'll see that um, one person is not there. Jace is not here today. He got a little sick. He might have COVID, I don't know what he has. So he could not be here. And we felt it'd be good that he didn't show up. So he's not here. So we have a, but even without Jason, we have a great, um, we have a great panel and I'll let them introduce themselves actually. I'll start from Nate and go from that and work our way in. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. So Nate France, uh, I have a couple jobs. Uh, so 18 years at the Geospatial Research Lab. That's Army Corps of Engineers uh, Engineer Research and Development Center. Uh, Done a lot of uh, R&D there, uh, mostly focused around mobile application development, uh, um, dismounted routing, uh, a few other things, APNT, assured positioning, et cetera. Um, also work uh, with the Army Geospatial Center. So I, I work with their standards team there for development and um, integration with Army Systems. Uh, and then also uh, a couple years ago, I started working with the TAC Product Center. So you're, if you're not familiar with TAC, it's the Team Awareness Kit on the civilian side, uh, or on the military side, it's the uh, Tactical Assault Kit. So if you've seen soldiers walking around with uh, a smartphone on their chest, that's the TAC software at the core of that. Uh, and there I am, the product owner for TACX, which is the desktop and mounted uh, platforms. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily Vitarich. I'm a geographer at the Census Bureau. Um, currently, I'm working as the project manager for the Geographic Update Partnership Software, or GUPS, which is an application that um, has a standalone, as well as now a web-based application that's solely built using open source. Hello. My name is Lydia Bright. You meet you. Hello, my name is Amanda Bright. I am a mathematician masquerading as a data scientist at NGA, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Uh, I've bounced around throughout the agency. Uh, I've ran a couple programs that implement computer vision into our NGA's mapping missions. Uh, at the moment, I am building data pipelines uh, and algorithmic solutions to our analyst teams. 
Yeah. Hi, my name is Steve Mather. I'm I'm the one non-federal person up here. I spent uh, 20 years in the public sector, uh, both on the academic and uh, park side of, of things. Um, spent the last couple of years at Oberlin College, and then just recently uh, became full-time at Open Drone Map. So focused on photogrammetry tool tool chains uh, for drones, surface vehicles, and and uncrewed aircraft. All right, thank you. And one thing I wanted to say about our panel, right? We got people from NGA, we got civilian senses, we got military, we got a little bit of everything on the panel. So when we get to answer these questions, we get it, we'll get responses from a lot of different points of views. So the first question goes in, it's real simple. It sounds funny, but I had a conversation and a lot of people answered a little different. To all you guys is, what is what is open source, right? Like everybody has a different definition. I know I talked to my Esri, they had a different answer than people maybe in this room today. So, and why is it beneficial for the government? I'll start for you, maybe. So to speak specifically uh, on the tax side, uh, to, to us, open source is really about access. Um, so with TAC, it's, uh, we, two years ago, we decided to open source the TAC core libraries. It's up on GitHub. Um, that was a significant event for us. It did a couple things. Obviously, we had to get public distribution to do that. Um, but we work closely uh, with, with our state, local, uh, and federal agencies um, within the, the TAC product center. Um, so we field to the FBI, uh, DHS, Border Patrol, uh, Department of Interior, um, really across all those spectrums, including our foreign military partners. Um, and so for us, open source is really about access to our product. Um, so right now we're, we're really experiencing a hyper growth um, a paradigm within TAC. We're, we're growing beyond our means uh, with the adoption of, of the capability and, and, and the mapping engine that, that is the core of TAC. Um, and open sourcing that was, was critical for us to be able to uh, give access to all our, our national and and foreign military partners. So from a census perspective, I guess open source to us, and especially the program and project that I work on, CUPS, um, open source is having a software and components to that software that are freely accessible um, and able to be modified with the source code. For us, with the GUPS program, we support around 12 participant programs, and those participant programs support the census. So with our GUPS program, we had our supporting software um, for the 2020 census we're building right now for 2030. So it's really important important for us to have that flexibility with open source to be able to modify what we need to get done for each one of these participant programs in a way that our participants and our stakeholders need. Um, in terms of how it's beneficial for us, it allows the Census Bureau to provide um, a GIS solution to our partners, so that's state, local, and federal government agencies, as well as our tribal partners. We are able to provide a software for them that's free to use. So I think that's really the benefit for us, is being able to provide access to them if they don't have access to those proprietary softwares. Um, so I would say from NGA's perspective, the definition of uh, open source geospatial software is pretty consistent with what we've heard so far. Really what it is is an opportunity for us to be able to take a low risk approach to try out new things. Uh, a, you know, a brand new analyst, a brand new scientist walking in the door, it's a lot less daunting to have to, you know, to be able to build, uh, you know, a simple software, a simple tool than it is to, you know, request some very large budget in order to procure the software that they're looking for. Uh, it's also a way for us to implement truly custom solutions to our problems, whether that is, you know, a specific workflow or just a new way to process data. Uh, and then lastly, it's also an invaluable medium for us to be able to share with the community, whether that be with a small business that we want to start, you know, lowering the barrier of entry for them to work with us, to, you know, the students at universities, to even, you know, attracting interns uh, that can kind of start in day one and be able to, you know, work on some of our problems. I'm not sure what to add to all that, so I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll, give an, I'll give an anecdote from, you know, in, in, in the space of whether it's, whether it's, uh, you know, federal agencies, whether it's, whether it's um, governments around the world or whether it's NGOs, one of the challenges is matching the software ecosystem to the, to the sustained mission of the organization. And um, as 
the software ecosystems mature, we realize that something may be offered for a while and then disappear. A service may appear and disappear. There's vendor lock-in. There's, there's challenges associated with exporting all your expertise and all your software outside the organization. And one thing that I think that free and open source software affords agencies and non-governmental organizations, et cetera, is that capacity to have, to own um, part of that capacity in-house and to not uh, be subject to the same level of vendor lock-in. Lock all right. Thank you for that. And this question is just for Nate. I know you talked about TAC, right? And <clears throat> the open source portion of it. What are issues, pros and cons of you know, with the open source in your program, like how does that, what are the, the, yeah, what are the pros and cons to that? Yeah, so for the pros, um, there's no question that um, just the, the the ability for us to integrate the libraries that we use. So right now within the TAC kernel or TAC core product um, across all of the TAC product lines. So if, again, if you're not familiar, TAC, TAC is um, uh, a, multi a multitude of, of software products. We have iTAC, ATAC, Android TAC, uh, Web TAC, uh, TAC X now, uh, Win TAC, et cetera. So across all those uh, uh, software capabilities, we have integrated uh, a number of open source libraries, including uh, GDAL or Google, um, Proj and Geos being the primary ones. And so what that does is it allows us to have a standard product across all of the product lines, um, which is absolutely critical uh, within the DOD and military, especially if you're talking about coordinate conversion. Um, if, you know, if I do a coordinate conversion in one program, it needs to align uh, across all those product lines. So, so the pros are, are really just having a standard product and for on the developer side, so so TAC is a, a plug-in architecture. So what we do is we create the core product uh, and allow industry uh, and other government agencies to come in and develop plugins. Uh, and in doing so, all of our API calls are to those core open source libraries, which is really critical. So we can again have a standard uh, plug-in API relatively standard plug-in plug API across all the product lines. Um, so it eases development too, which of course lowers cost. Uh, on the cons, uh, not many, but what I would say is I, I'm still not convinced that we have a open source license that fits the government model, um, specifically with continuous delivery. So we have an, a pretty big issue right now. So we're GPL v3, nothing wrong with the license. It's a great license. Um, but for us to be able to to put that into our CI and CD pipelines and our DevSecOps stack, um, it's very difficult because we have to have a human in the loop uh, at some point to be able to push the public release button. Um, so we have lags in us pushing out our product line out to out to GitHub in this case. Um, so that's that's kind of the, a con for us. Uh, I, I'm not a license expert, um, so I wouldn't know how to fix that. Uh, or DevSecOps experts, I wouldn't really know how to fix that. We are working on it, uh, but there's definitely um, some some things that we need to figure out. And, and maybe it is a kind of a government-specific license or an extension of a license that enables us to to be able to to push some of this out. And, and be able to just keep up with the, the word of the letter of the license itself, which is where we, we get a little trouble. Yeah, and actually, I'm glad you brought up the licenses, and this is something that I, any, like any program, it could be geospatial or in IT, whatever, there's always been issues or questions about open source versus proprietary COTS, forgots. So my new, my next question, and I'll target this for Amanda and Emily, mm -hmm. you know, how does, <clears throat> How does open source geospatial tools, or you can say any tools, um, compare with their their counterparts, their proprietary counterparts, parts, COTS and GODs, in terms of capability, reliability? I'll let either one of you guys jump in on that. Bad. Um, so as far as capabilities and reliability, I think there isn't a huge gap between one and the other. I think a lot of it is more user preference. Uh, I think as far as open source, it definitely has more versatility. If you can imagine it, I think you can build it with open source software. Uh, but it can have kind of a higher lift, uh, especially up front. You need to have the expertise to be able to build it. Um, and I think that is, that is a challenge that you know I'm sure we'll get into some more. Yeah. 
think Amanda stole everything I wanted to say, but... Uh, <laughs> what well, she just said, right? Yeah, right, what she just said. Um, no, I, I totally agree. I think they're on the same level in terms of functionality. I do a agree as well, you know, that, that lift at the start. You don't have as many resources behind you that some proprietary softwares would have. Um, but right, the flexibility is there, the flexibility to be able to make it your own and use the libraries that are available to you to your advantage. I think that's huge. Um, you know, and sometimes with proprietary software, you're limited by what's already there. But with open source, you have the opportunity to do something new or something different with what you have. And um, again, Amanda said the creativity, if you can dream it, you can more than likely do it. So that sounded way too motivational. But um, <laughs> it, it's there, you know, if you, can, if you can develop it, I think you have a high possibility that it can get done. Here. And I love this one little antidote. I don't know who I'm not I don't know who takes credit for it. So if someone in this room, I'm still in what you told me before. Um, they talk about like the difference between like COTS versus open source, right? The little antidote is like Coke versus Pepsi, whereas Coke is free being open source and Pepsi is like a lot of money. You gotta pay a lot of money for it. So I just remember someone telling me that in the beginning that it really resonated with me. All right, so we're going to the next question. What strategies can the, can the government employ to effectively collect, integrate, and adopt open source data to enhance their decision-making processes and drive innovations? I'll talk, start off with you, sir. You. Mm, yeah, I think it's stopping. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew I was next. I was just... <laughs> um, open source data yeah. integration. Um, well, I think we've seen some good examples in, in, in the presentations that we've seen so far today. I think one of the, one of the things that, um, that I've specialized in over my career has been connecting the gaps. So we've got, we've got really great, um, from, from the 1970s onward, we have, we have really great uh, readily available satellite imagery, and that, that's only gotten better through time. I think one thing that we don't yet close the gap on is high-resolution data and tasking high-resolution data. So how do we ensure that we do change detection? How do we find the opportunities for gathering higher-resolution data when we need it, whether that's disasters, whether that's just uh, uh, ephemeral changes through time? And I think um, that's, that's a pattern and a, a challenge and an opportunity uh, for governments, NGOs, and, and for, uh, for, for regular folk uh, across the world. So I think that's one place. All right, cool. Nate? Yeah. Oh, tough one. Uh, governance and money. So <laughs> just need a little bit more money. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> this one's tough. On the DOD side, uh, obviously we deal with uh, classified networks quite a bit. Yeah. Even if it's at the uh, classified or excuse me, the controlled unclassified level. Um, so we, for us, it, it really is it's just trying to leverage um, some of the cross-domain capabilities that exist so, and, and, and try to understand where more could exist. So right now we're working with DARPA uh, on a program called SHARE. Um, it's, it's fairly limited, but the DARPA SHARE program is, is uh, expanding our cross-domain capabilities so we, so we can pass information uh, up and down the chain. Um, so you know, right now we, we every heavily leverage uh, OpenStreetMap data and GNOME data uh, once it goes into a tax system, it, it, that, that's that's it. It's a one way. It's a one way street. Um, so we, you know, we've got to continue to, to figure out ways to to provide governance to be able to push data back down. Um, and, and, and I think a big part of that's going to be cloud native. Um, so I think for the open source uh, folks here is, is we've got to really start to, to focus on a more cloud native environment. So we spent, you know, most of the 2010s and 2000s uh, working on the DIL environment. So disconnected, intermittent, limited bandwidth, um, which is a, a big problem that, that the DOD still, you know, strives to fix. But as that gets better, which it is getting better, um, we've got to have uh, the ability to be able to push things back up to a, a cloud native capability. Okay, and I got to add on to it a little bit from Jason because he's texting me now. I'm going to say his responses. 
Um, so I'm going to try to do this real time. But one thing he did mention is with the, um, the data, he mentioned, you know, uh, just getting the, the environment more used to like application like OpenStreetMap, right? Because like the information that's an OpenStreetMap, there's just so much information, so much intelligence from that. Just seeing what's there and incorporating it in there. It might not be the final answer. It might not, you might not use that for your sole decision, but it goes to incorporate and enhance your mission, your, your decision making process. Processes. So, thanks, Jason. All right. <laughs> All right. This next question, I'm actually going to ask everybody this. So, this one, like, what challenges has government agencies faced, mis i.e., misconceptions in adopting open source software, and how they overcome that? Right. So, I'm going to. Who am I going to start with on this one? I am going to start with Amanda. Let's go, Amanda. Um, so I would say the biggest challenge for open source software may not be very different than the challenge to getting adoption of any new software is really has a lot to do with culture. You know, when you have a team that has been using the same software, the same workflows for, you know, 20 years, introducing uh, a new product can be can be very difficult, especially when there's not the expertise um, to use that or, you know, the time they feel to learn a new software. Um, so, huge challenge, and I think that it is definitely not a solved problem, but there have been a lot of inroads made. Uh, there have been a lot of champions for open source software. You'll hear from a couple of them later. Um, and, you know, I'm always very impressed by, you know, the new analysts and the new scientists coming in at kind of the backgrounds that they have and the, you know, extraordinary, you know, efforts they have gone through, you know, to get these into their own workflows and to share them out. Emily? Sure. So one of the big things um, at the census was getting the approvals that we needed. So, you know, we are trying to move away from proprietary software. So getting those approvals and the buy-in from everyone involved to move to open source um, kind of was was a little hard at first. Um, there's also some mistrust when it comes with open source. You know, you're you're used to where using a certain software. Um, like Amanda said, you know, trying to point people in another direction may may cause them to mistrust what we're trying to do. Um, especially when it comes to security, making sure that you know these open source softwares uh, make sure that the federal space is able to meet those security needs that it need um, needs to enact with those open source softwares. And then um, I guess the, the one other challenge is getting the full support. So like I said, you need approvals, but there's a lot of people involved in creating softwares and creating um, systems and applications. And you need to make sure that everyone's on board before you move full steam ahead. Um, I will say that in overcoming that, you know, the big thing is just kind of showing them what can be done. I guess I wrote on my notes here, and it's kind of cheesy, but the proof is in the pudding. You know, like if you can use your open source software to do something, um, you need to kind of show what can be done in order to make people believe and make people jump on board as to what you can use that open soft source open source software for. Yeah, I, th I think it's education. Uh, unfortunately, still at this 2023, we're still here. Um, so, still have a lot of senior leaders that, that just need to understand uh, the difference between software and acquisition. Um, that's the biggest thing with us. Uh, you know, free. F Free isn't free, uh, and acquisition cost or acquisition cost. Um, and so, to, you know, it, it, not always, but a lot of times I, th I think the software costs um, are, are drastically minimized by the acquisition and sustainment process, particularly within Army systems. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll field software for a decade more or more. Um, and, so, you know, so in that, the, the, the cost of the software isn't, you know, the biggest cost. It's the procurement uh, of all the systems and installing the software and, and developing the software. Software, um, you know, and so I, I think to the positive side of that is, um, you know, we are seeing a lot of modular software systems come online, and that's, you know, the, I talked about TAC having being a plug-in architecture. Um, I, I think that we need to continue to to push modular systems so that it's not GOTS, COTS, FOSS. It's 
hey, here's a product that does something, put it in the stack or take it out. So just to maybe pick on uh, open dr drone maps a little bit, I mean, um, you know, we could have a, a, photogram a photogrammetry process where we're pulling data from, say, Maxar, um, run it through a process, and it could be a pluggable uh, thing where it's open drone map for some users, and it's if somebody wants to pay for Pix4D, then it's Pix4D for other users. Maybe it does something that open drone map doesn't. Um, but just to be able to swap those software systems in and out, and again, whether it's COTS, GOTS, FOSS, whatever. Um, so these modular frameworks are working, uh, but there's still a lot of work to do there. Yeah, it's the interchange and the ability to swap, I think is, I don't want to say it's more important than open source, but you know, from a procedural standpoint, at least my experience on the governance side, the idea that I can take this thing and change it up for something else when there's something that's more suitable for purpose um, is huge. Or procurement is a thing sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the best thing, but it's the thing that's already authorized. Um, about uh, at, at Phosphor G in, in Italy last year, um, had a conversation um, with a similarly structured organization, NGO in this case, and there was a lot of emphasis on on the cost savings of free and open source. And and I said, whoa, whoa wait, wait, wait. <laughs> As someone who benefits from budgets, um, I don't want to overemphasize that 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 characteristic of it. There are costs to doing the development and the deployment, and there are um, and that can be internalized or externalized. Um, but really that, that question of can you, can you demo something quickly? Can you, um, can you uh, it, do you know that that's going to be around for the long term when you finally do go through the procurement process if, if that's necessary for what you're doing? I think these are some of the, some of the things that um, are often things that people overemphasize, not so much something that's wrong about how they're thinking about the software uh, and the process, but the opportunities are, um, are really, can you, can you do something without procurement um, in order to try something out? Is that, is that something that you can demo? Um, is it, can you take in uh, a component that you want to reuse uh, from some research someone's joined in your organization? You can do that quickly, and how do you make that happen? And I'm rambling, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all right. Good answer. Um, we got a few more questions. So the next question goes into data, on data privacy, right? And that's something you always give with open source. People who are not fans of open source are like, like oh, data, your stuff is not going to be secure. So how does, how, do, how does do open source geospatial tool address concerns and related data with data privacy and protection? And are there policies and regulations in place that promote the adoption in government with projects? That's going to be that's a whole. That's a good question. I'll start with you, and we have this one. Okay. Um, so I think coming from the Census Bureau, you know, data privacy is huge. You know, that's one of our big missions is you know securing the data and the information of our respondents and the people of the United States. So um, I think in terms of open source geospatial tools, the one thing that really has benefited us is the ability to add in additional security scannings into our source code. Um, so we've been working really closely with our IT department and our Office of Information Security to make sure that we are implementing and including the most up-to-date and the most thorough um, security scannings in our application. You know, we have been entrusted to ensure this data, so we're trying to make sure it's done right. Um, one thing's in, like, kind of promoting the adoption of government projects. Um, the Census Bureau is uh, promoting a True North initiative, and really what that's doing is they want to move in the way of moving away from proprietary software and moving towards more open source. So I think it's really big coming from the census as a whole to say, hey, we, we understand and we see the benefits in, in open source, we're going to move this way. And I think with that comes with the addition and the adoption of additional security that goes into it. Um, so I think it's only going to get bigger, especially with what the census is doing, but I really do think that um, we're, we're only starting with what we're doing and what we're adding to our data privacy securities. Steve, really? Oh, I think I think David Carter already answered this uh, for me earlier in talking about the fact that you could have you could have a photogrammetry tool that you can't audit, and you have a photogrammetry tool that you can, and that can be a critical uh, thing when you're when you're looking at your at your full tool chain and making sure that you've got appropriate data security. Yeah, 
and from Jason, he with Don, I'm trying to piece text of you again. Um, he, he was just saying that he loves the fact, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, he likes the fact that the open source of it, because it allows you to see all the code and have access to the code and run stuff how you want to run it and add different modules and whatnot to assure you um, he gets it and complies with the NGA and or other agency standards. So that's his answer, Kyle. All right, <clears throat> um, the last question we have before we go into questions. All right, so we're here now. We're, you know, every agency is doing it. And where do you see this? Where do you see this, this? The role of open source geospatial tools evolving in the next five to ten years. So, what what number is this on um, Fed Geo Day? What number is this? Ten. Ten. So at twenty, right? Where are we going to be at? And I'll start. With, I'll start. My to come on, so like. Yes, I. I mean, I, the easy answer is just wider adoption for sure. Uh, I, I, I think us open source insurgents are, are winning the war. <laughs> um, but, you know, we're seeing that really at the ground level, you know, with us open sourcing some of the TAC product line, uh, that was a pretty big deal for us. Um, you know, we're going to have to continue with the governance side of it. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, not just recommending that open source is, is looked at, but maybe start to actually say, no, you're going to actually adopt these open source packages. And I think that that can be on the, the contractual side or the procurement side as well, where we um, just start to write into contracts that, you know, thou shalt use open source libraries where available. Um, so, I, yeah, I think there's still a lot of governance to do there. And I, I think we'll see it in the next five to 10 years. Um, I, I did want to take a little bit of time and say where I think we should go, but I, 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 I can't, can't see the future. So there's a, there's a couple of things where I, I think we, we need to expand some of our capabilities, um, not just with open source, but, but, you know, really across the whole paradigm. And that's uh, a lot to do with 3D. Um, so there's, there's there's, there's obviously a pretty, pretty, pretty big groundswell with 3D data. Um, on our side, we've started to reach the upper limit uh, on the visualization side, uh, and I can get into that if we want. Um, but for us, it's really about the analytic sides of bringing 3D content into the uh, environment to be able to run analytics. So line of sight is no more, you know, DTED 30 or DTED, you know, two with 30 meter data. Uh, we need to be able to see if there's trees in the way, if there's buildings in the way. So we need high res data, 3D data to do that. Um, just to give you some examples. Um, the other thing is, is uh, uh, User experience. Um, so this is something. So so we deliver deliver the TAC product in four month uh, cycles. So every four months there's a new TAC product out there. Um, we took one whole cycle last year to completely redo our user experience. Um, so I think that I would say that that's probably true with most of the open source capabilities that are out there. Um, not just the UI side of it. That's certainly important, but the user experience. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of finish on this. I, I asked my team uh, how can open source support them better in the next five to 10 years. And uh, one, of my, one of my guys is a Marine, uh, one of the guys I work with uh, is a Marine. Uh, and he said, how can, how can we make GeoServer so easy to use that a crown eater uh, can, <laughs> can, can install it, manage it, and be able to disseminate data out to our end users? Uh, so, so I think there's a lot to be said with uh, the user experience with a lot of the open source libraries and uh, software systems. Thank you. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think it's only going to get bigger. You know, one aspect of our um, GUPS contract is that um, open source software is used. So that's something we've been doing since 2015 in our application. You know, it's been open source since then, and we're only going to continue that as we move forward. Um, another thing, and this is bigger than the Census Bureau, but um, I was doing some research before I was preparing for this, and I saw that the White House had put out a request for information asking federal agencies as well as um, private sector on information about open source software security and memory safe um, programming languages. So <laughs> you're okay. <laughs> so um, I think it's not great to look at it. <laughs> He got excited. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think if it's coming from the White House, you know, it's something that we should pay attention to. So um, I only think it's going to get bigger from there. You know, there's an open software or open source software security initi initiative as well. So um, really, I, I, I think I agree with what was said before. And I think everyone up here would agree it's only going to get bigger. 
Yeah, I mean, I would say that a lot of hard work has already been done, at least at NGA. Um, you know, as far as you know, requesting new open source software, uh, it is in government speak, a pretty painless process. And so, you know, making that part easy, uh, making it easy to follow all the security rules makes it a lot easier to get things in the door and helps keep people motivated to actually use the software when it comes out the other side. Um, and as we start seeing, you know, these softwares being included in, you know, curriculums in high school and college, um, I think that we're going to start seeing more and more analysts and scientists coming and joining the workforce with these skills already, uh, which I think will make it that much easier. Um, as we now have, you know, people that have championed this software climbing the ranks, and they'll be the ones making the calls in hopefully five to ten years. So I feel like we've we sort of emerged as a as a highly connected world, and there's opportunities and challenges that come with that, and that's that's been my lifetime. But that's also been in a time where where frankly we have not had um, as strong as as well as well funded as well maintained as well uh, um, coordinated uh, governance globally. Um, and I see whether it's OpenStreetMap, whether it's free and open source software, whether it's you know name your name your open source thing. I think there's been a lot of development and opportunity in that space. And one of the things that I'm hoping to see in the next 10, 20, 40 years is additional government ownership of the ecosystems. Like, and, and by that I mean investment in exactly what's happening um, and and growth of so that so that. Um, Ooh. Um, so that uh, I'm not ADHD at all. <laughs> um, so that we really see. Um, so that we really see as as we're seeing now, as we continue to see things come out of not, not just you know what's the procurement, what's the process for bringing software in, but as we see software being started, developed, and disseminated out from government. Yeah, and I'll just add my two cents on this. I would love to see in the five, ten years, you know, you get to work with a lot of different agencies and they're like, well, we were just told that we have to use Esri, right? And we were told to do that, that's what we're using. I would love the fact that, you know, I know so recently on some proposals and stuff that uh, they were starting to do open source was open source, like geo servers, QGIS of all being used and be like, hey, this is something we're going to include in this, right? So I would love in five, ten years when we come back here, it becomes not this special thing. This has become the norm, right? If they want to use Esri, fine. If Esri is the solution, fine, use it. In if open source, QGIS, and Postgres, whatever, whatever, if that's the solution, use that and make that a part of the, the normal baseline. Not a one-off. Not like, why are we doing like, yes, it's in there, right? So I would love to see that be involved more and more. So we're going to go into Q&A. Does anybody have any questions? Questions? All right. Yes, sir. Good post. Just briefly, uh, can you speak to a customer support, user support with um, uh, open source platform? Got the kitchen. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'd be too happy to your customer support and support. I'm talking about just conventional tier one, tier two uh, for users. I could speak to that. I don't know about anybody else. <laughs> no, I think that's on a program the program basis. I know one of the programs I support, they do have support for that, right? They had support set up to do tier one, tier two support for that for that capability. But to your point that until you get gets embedded into the agencies and stuff, it will be more, hopefully in five, ten years it'll be more and more. But usually, you know, if there's a problem with Geo server or something is going to like one person because <laughs> that's the one person that can answer the question. But hopefully in the future, you know, the whole everybody will know how to answer these questions. Yeah, I know for us specifically, and I don't know if this is quite getting at your question, but uh, when we open source TAC, uh, put it up on uh, GitHub, there was a pretty much immediately there was a Discord server set up, uh, and so that's a lot of the open source, you know, non-DoD, non-federal government support that's out there is is now there's a Discord server where you can go ask questions, both development and then uh, use usage of the actual software itself. Um, so I think one of the things you see when you do open source is like the community then jumps in Azure. <laughs> As, as your, uh, you know, customer support team, um, and so we we now track this Discord server because we learn things there too. All right, you had a question, Olza. Look, 
Oh, get it go, please. <laughs> I'm going all the way to the back, so you know, it takes a minute to walk back here, so. I have three questions. All right. And my first question would be for Amanda, because you happened to mention um, the software would need to be in the hands of um, high schoolers or, or uh, my college, I will, uh, college students. I would like to, can you please um, give us some names of that software that would need to be in the hands of those college students, seeing how I work in a high school? Sure. Um, so uh, working with, there actually were some high school interns that were pretty impressive. I'm probably outliers from the average high school student, but I mean, they were using GIS software, they were trading machine learning algorithms. So this was actually, I was very impressed at, you know, learning, you know, Postgres, uh, PostGIS, and, you know, GIS software like QGIS uh, okay. to be able to, you know, actually you know, produce results. Uh, he specifically was looking at drone imagery, which. Okay, so. thank you. And my next question is for Emily. Emily, you happen to mention um, that the, there's an initiative with the government on open, so, open source software security initiative. Could you give us some more, a bit of information about if there's a website? Um, just a little bit more information on that, please. Sure, and I got it in my notes. Um, yeah, so in pre prepping for this panel, you know, I found out that um, it, it's good to not be alone in terms of open source. So um, one of the things that I saw in my research was a policy coming out from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, so that's C-I-S-A, um, and they released an open source software security map, um, basically recognizing the benefits of open source software and voiced their support. Um, and in that article, it pointed me in a lot of different directions about um, the White House National Security Strategy, as well as the National Cybersecurity Strategy Implementation Plan, and all of those point to these open source initiatives and security in initiatives that they have have. Um, and then I know the other thing that I mentioned was the, the White House executive order, or the request for information. Um, but if you want to talk to me after this, I can point you in better directions. It's hard. I don't have like the URL on hand, but I can point you in the direct direction. Okay. And the, the next question, I just couldn't remember if it was Stephen or Nathan that happened to mention um, about the need for high resolution data and how to leverage that with the um, cloud. Could you please give um, uh, more details? <laughs> yeah. So um, a little bit of bias ex you know, exposed in that in that example um, because I run a project that helps you take uh, local imagery and turn it into high resolution data. Um, but I think one gap that we have is where do we need to get, where do we need data and how do we task that? So at a global scale, you know, um, how do you how do you figure out how, where you need to collect the, the high resolution data? So you can fly a small uncrewed aircraft, um, collect a bunch of images, process it through some photogrammetry software, and get elevation models and and uh, ortho photos from above, um, and three dimensional models as well. Um, but the question is, where do you need to do that? And that's that's I think, uh, and, uh, and a, a space that needs more explore, exploration. Uh -huh. All right. I've been told we are out of time. We are out of time. All our panelists should be floating around here. If you want to find them and ask some more questions, I, I recommend that you guys do. I want to thank you guys all for doing this panel with me. Thank you very much, and see you guys around. We are going to roll right into the next session, uh, which is going to be the GIO Roundtable. Um, uh, and I can't use a trackpad. 
what is going on here? <laughs> um, so I invite David Carter to the stage, who's going to be our moderator today. David serves as the Geospatial Information Officer for the U.S. Department of the Interior. Uh, he leads the DUI Geospatial Advisory Committee, which consists of geospatial leads for 11 bureaus in the offices of the Secretary. Um, in his role, he's also the managing partner of the Federal Geo Platform at geoplatform.gov. Advance one slide. Go down the best slide. Okay. There you yeah, go. Yeah, it's getting there. Are we good? All right. All right. Well, thank, well, thank you. It's one. Is this working? It's one lagged, so that's really weird. There we go. All right. Yep. All right. Is it, okay, it's working. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, and I'd like to have our panel members introduce themselves. So, I'll pass the microphone. You, you go. <laughs> we know who he is. Okay. Uh, my name is Jesse Rosell. I'm with FEMA headquarters out of Washington, D.C. I run a team called the Natural Hazards Risk Assessment Program, and we provide uh, risk assessment data sets, tools, and methodological guidance for the emergency management community, um, and all of which are um, geospatial based. I'm Ron Cicada. I'm the Geospatial Information Officer for USDA, as well as the Senior Agency Official for Geospatial Information. And USDA, uh, with uh, over 70,000 authorized users of uh, GIS software, both uh, commercial and open source, uh, pretty much uh, every aspect of each and every one of our agencies and offices uh, runs uh, on, uh, on geospatial products. Uh, we we have um, we have uh, trade uh, forecasts that are entirely driven uh, on geospatial loan programs and conservation programs, rural development uh, that runs uh, on geospatial engines. We have our uh, outbreak uh, folks that deal with animal and plant health diseases. Uh, all of these forecasts run on geospatial uh, frameworks. Uh, there's hardly uh, an aspect of USDA that does not. Uh, take advantage of uh, of this uh, uh, of this um, of this world, and yet uh, our challenges uh, remain uh, uh, developing. Whether it's the frequency of agricultural uh, uh, disasters or, or the uh, challenges of uh, feeding the world over the next uh, 10 years. So I uh, look forward uh, to uh, continue to uh, integrate our work and uh, ensuring that the uh, total is greater than the sum of its parts. All right, well, thank you. So we, we have a number of questions here that we're going to just open up to the panel and have a little discussion. And towards the end, depending on how much time we have left, we'll have, we can have some questions from the audience. So the, the first thing that we've got here is how, in, your, in your agency, so how, how much open geospatial software is used in your agency, and are you trying to grow that use? I could start. Um, when we're asked uh, about our open source usage within FEMA, I usually break it down into open source software, open science, and open data. Um, open science and open data we use frequently. Um, uh, we manage a, a couple of risk models, one called the National Risk Index that looks at your uh, natural hazard risk from 18 different hazards, as well as social vulnerability and community resilience impacts around the nation, um, as well as our hazardous model. And both of those, it's immensely important for us that our scientific methods are open, transparent, and credible, um, as well as our data sets. So not only do we put all the data out in an open data format with excellent metadata, but we also have to back that up with thousands of pages of technical information on which science organizations we worked with, the exact methods we used to calculate these losses, and all the way down to the 
geospatial processes we use to tie all of this together so that someone could reverse engineer what we've done um, if they want to dig deeper in what we do. Um, and additionally, we um, develop um, quite a few open source tools uh, for our HAZIS program um, that we share the source code out there um, freely. And uh, we also use um, Esri software quite a bit too because we are a large organization as well. So we kind of do both. So I'll mention briefly uh, in terms of uh, open source and uh, growing our open source community, um, we are incipient um, in that process, but nevertheless very serious. I have to tell you, um, this is the first time uh, I come to this uh, to this conference. Uh, just in the first session, I attended um, prompt engineering, and uh, my reflection from that discussion and from visiting with you um, is that uh, innovation uh, lies largely in the open source community. There, there's no question that the kind of uh, work presentations, and again, uh, just, uh, I just got here, and this is my first time. Um, at USDA, we have uh, over 30 years of uh, working with uh, commercial uh, software. About 1%, uh, give or take, of our 70,000 plus users uh, work on uh, open source. The applications tend to be a niche in the sense that uh, if you're doing a remote sensing analysis, if you're trying to derive uh, croplands from satellite imagery or high altitude uh, fixed wing capture, you're, you're going to do that uh, with open source products, almost as a rule. You're not going to use some of these large uh, commercial packages. However, starting this year, uh, just about a month ago, our program manager for our enterprise geospatial management office and myself, I'm the executive uh, uh, leader for the geospatial portfolio, announced a, a diversification initiative. That's uh, one of the reasons we're here today, because we want to get educated about the possible and increasingly um, characterize the work that we do and the training we do and how we characterize staff in terms of training being done with commercial products and starting to map capabilities between the open source community and um, from the human resources to the technology part to map to the commercial products we um, we currently use. So uh, we are very committed. Uh, diversification of the portfolio are, is going to make us long-term stable. But again, uh, I also see the uh, tremendous advantages in our work internationally when we're trying to uh, share products with uh, uh, developing countries. It tends to be uh, my first experience uh, recently with open source was developing uh, epidemiological forecasts uh, for Jamaica for pest management uh, with, with grass. So I see a lot of opportunities for growth. Very excited, but I have to confess, uh, we're just starting. Just very, very happy to uh, to be here. Well, I'll just say for the Department of Interior, we, we've been using open source software for a long time, uh, but it, but it's still a small percentage of a lot of the work that's done. And we, we are looking to grow that use, um, just like USDA here. We're looking to diversify more, uh, just to try and see what workflows and what kind of analysis and all, and what, what can we send to, to a variety of software. The... Uh, the, the geo platform itself is largely developed on open software. So a lot of it is, is cloud native processing, uh, open software is behind the scenes, and that's really what drives the, the work in the geo platform. So, uh, so our, I guess leading, leading into that, so if, if we're looking to diversify, we're looking to grow the use of open source software across our agencies, so what, what do you have to consider? How do you plan for working in like a, a multi-software hybrid environment? So. so we, um, 
we hear comments around FEMA a lot. We've got a lot of tools and it adds a lot of complexity and why are there so many tools? Why isn't there just one tool? Can't we make one tool that does everything? Um, I always um, recommend that we don't do that because to make one tool that serves all program needs and all stakeholders throughout the country um, would be a significant challenge to get everyone's priorities in there and to meet the user needs of everyone. One thing we do emphasize is uh, a common nationwide uh, data framework and a risk assessment framework to make sure that the sea of tools out there have uh, recommended and documented use cases, interoperability, and things like that. So we really try to emphasize interoperability of data and not just data sets, but workflows and program outputs across our enterprise. Um, whether they're open source, whether they're proprietary software, et cetera. And, and I think you also have to consider certainly the secure, you know, anytime you introduce a software stack in your portfolio, you have a number of security issues that, that you know, you sort of, from the uh, overhead perspective of managing multiple software packages, you inherit twice what you do when you have just one. So I think when you're considering that sort of integration, it's it's hugely important to make sure you have your IT staff on board and, and you're ready to go through the accreditation process and things like that, I think. I think in terms of the approach, uh, we're, we're looking at separating the IT geo part from the so-called business part, the applications and the data capture. Uh, so what, what, I, um, what we're looking for is uh, aspects of uh, network optimization, uh, your uh, data pipelines, uh, moving data around between agencies, optimizing geospatial data pipelines, uh, optimizing streaming analytics, and um, in monitoring costs, if you're working in a, 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 a dual environment uh, where we uh, we try to have complementary capabilities from uh, the commercial side and uh, the open source side, we need to understand what that migration I is going to look like. So now in that migration element, uh, we move a little bit beyond the IT side and into the business side, trying to understand, as has already been uh, mentioned here, what the workflows are and what those look like and what those costs of migration uh, in terms of training our cadres um, and uh, hosting these different uh, open source problem uh, platforms is gonna is gonna cost us so we um, we have a very uh, deliberate approach and it be begins already with our uh, updated uh, workforce development strategy which uh, you know starts to map what we call a uh, geospatial specialist what we call a, a GIS analyst, what we call somebody with core, you know, um, capabilities and develop a, a common denominator across uh, our certifications from commercial products with certifications, uh, you know, using, say, QGIS uh, and otherwise. So again, our approach is to separate uh, the native IT geo from business and uh, and develop uh, developing uh, close attention to cost. But uh, beginning again uh, this year. Um, looking at the people force uh, first approach and developing that workforce uh, development strategy geo which we hope uh, to be able to publish just in the next couple months well, and for us we're we're trying to emphasize keeping data into in open formats so even if you are using a commercial data set or any data set or any software sorry uh, the end product needs to be made available in an open format so that anybody else can use it you don't have to buy that software in order to be able to use the federal data so that's that's one of the ways we've been trying to do it which which kind of leads into our, our next question for the group here is what what makes data authoritative? That's a tricky one, and and uh, and often a source of contention sometimes. I, I think an easy answer is if you you have a clear statutory requirement to create a data set from Congress, that data set is clearly authoritative. Um, I would say though, um, I've seen the word authoritative used a lot for 
in place of best available data, and I think best available data is a better fit in often um, a lot of instances because the right data set may depend on the specific use case, and it's not always as clear as yes or no, or this data set or that data set. So um, we we and, and FEMA have used authoritative data as a term a little bit less and less because the landscape of hazard risk is so complex and constantly changing. For a second. And I think Carter's got a panel this afternoon on authoritative data. You, you might you might want to plan to plan to attend. So. <laughs> But it will be a really exciting discussion, and, and I do think authoritative has a very particular legal meaning, so I think we misuse that term to mean a lot of things that it doesn't really mean. But. So we have a, we have a definition. Uh, we just published our departmental regulation. Obviously, you don't have to uh, take this down, but it's a departmental regulation 3465-001, uh, where we've uh, defined authoritative data uh, as, a, as a starting point. Uh, I'll tell you what it is in just a half a second. It is essential that we, uh, that we get on the same page with what we mean by authoritative data, because uh, the pedigree of data, uh, open data, is really important. Um, if you're running, working in federal space, we need to understand understand what constitutes uh, authoritative for USDA for USDA authoritative data has already been mentioned if it's that if it's required by statute uh, to collect this data a lot of our soils data a lot of our imagery data cropland data is required by statute to be collected uh, that is considered authoritative we consider that if the data is going to be informing policy or management that data has to be authoritative because if you're going to be again I think about the opposite if you're running policy, informing policy, or uh, advancing management programs for farmers and ranchers and producers and landscape uh, managers, what's the opposite of authoritative? Uh, it, it, obviously, that's not a pleasant thought. And if the data is going to be made public by a non-research organization, it's going to make the data public, uh, that has the stamp of USDA on it. Uh, again, non-research, uh, and there's a reason for that exception. Then that data is considered authoritative. That being said, um, when we talk about open data uh, uh, from whatever source, uh, you know, synthetic data, crowdsourced data, uh, data that is shared uh, by academia, uh, we, we need to uh, advance a shared understanding of what those parameters mean. Ultimately, authoritative data in general for us, independent of those uh, four attributes that I just gave, uh, all of it has to have metadata that is valid and machine readable. And all of it, uh, whether it's inc inclusive in data, uh, metadata or otherwise, it needs to have indicators of quality so we can uh, speak to the uncertainty about it. So with those parameters, uh, we're advancing our inventories and data catalogs, something that we just started a year ago. Okay. Thank you. So you, you mentioned you mentioned crowdsource data. So is is there? <laughs> so that that is that's kind of a new newer area for Department of Interior. Uh, we've had some experience and trials with that, uh, particularly with the USGS and the the Trails Initiative that just got kicked off here. Where we're looking to support that as well. So is is there a role for crowdsourced or public resource data in federal government? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think absolutely. I think it's one of the really exciting places we have an opportunity to rethink how we're doing our, you know, our data. And I, it, you know, do, it, it presents a lot of really interesting questions and opportunities, right? Do, do we need to create our own data? Do we even need to store our own data? What are, what are, you know, what's the the line between agency data and agency responsibility, and what can we use volunteer geographic information for? And I, I think. You know, this is a place where we can all really start to rethink how we think about our data and what does it mean to have data, because there are huge changes in in industry. I mean, OpenStreetMap clearly is a huge, you know, player in this space that 
makes us ask these questions of like, what does it really, you know, what does it mean to create data or to update my data? And how can I take, you know, how can I partner with the nine or so million people that are creating data that can do things or editing and updating data that can do things on us at a speed and scale that most agencies can't possibly compete with. And then, you know, brings in questions of authoritative data and, you know, what does it mean to have a, a data set that's maintained, you know, by nine million people but is it best available? Is it fit for purpose? Is it authoritative? And, and I think it just gives us a real opportunity to rethink, you know, and ask ourselves some really basic questions that we thought we always knew the answer to, which is like, it's got to be mine. I need to do it here. I have to own all of it. I have to do all of it. And it has to be, you know, tied in. And so I don't think there's an answer, but I think there's a huge opportunity there for us to, to rethink how we do this work. Yeah, I would echo all of that. Um, a lot of opportunity, and I could see immense value in that um, in, in the disaster risk space. Um, when we look at the risk assessment cycle, we have to look at you know all the, the buildings in the nation, the infrastructure, the population, the hazards, and then how we calculate risk. And as soon as we're done, we have to start over because everything in the country has changed. So I, I could see a lot of value in the ability to better leverage uh, crowdsourced data. One thing I know that um, uh, is a challenge to us getting started, at least in my team, is uh, clearly define best practices for governing efforts like that, validating it and integrating it into our portfolio of what we do. But I know it's out there, we just gotta dig deeper. I'll mention some uh, anecdotes as opposed to anything uh, systematic uh, at USDA. Um, it's been useful. Uh, I don't know if you remember a couple years ago in the news, you were hearing about the murder hornet and they kill people, you know, the Asian murder hornet. They don't call it like that anymore in USDA. It's a terrible name, which is why probably I'm using it. Uh, because <laughs> it certainly caught a lot of attention. Uh, later, you heard perhaps of the uh, spotted lanternfly. I started in Pennsylvania, very, very damaging, and it's been useful uh, to um, working with, for example, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture to uh, ask the public uh, to help us uh, define the perimeter, you know, how, how far it spread by calling in information and then sending uh, inspectors to verify uh, those um, potential positives. So whether it's uh, these two anecdotes or otherwise, this kind of information does have its role. We acknowledge the uncertainty associated with it, but uh, you know, by baking in a process of verification and, and diagnostics, uh, it, it is very useful. The other part, my reflection is, you're using open data and crowdsourced data already. Uh, all of you probably are using um, LLMs already and sneaking behind government work into your personal computers and doing a little bit of strategic plans and proposals on ChatGPT. Well, guess where all that data is coming from? So it's inevitable, right? It's inevitable. Uh, we're, we're heading to an increasingly crowdsourced uh, world. So again, getting back to uh, authorita authoritative nature of data verification, I think it's going to present a, an opportunity for all of us. And uh, I didn't mean what I said about you, I, you guys not uh, respecting the prohibitions that we have in place about not using uh, ChatGPT on your government computers. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. I'm sure... Uh, Josh is the only one that does that. <laughs> uh, I'd also be probably remiss not to mention, you know, I think the the Citizen Science Act is is a great uh, indication of the federal government's kind of understanding and, and embracing this idea of, of volunteer information, not just geographic information. But I'm not going to pretend I'm a Citizen Science Act expert here, but, you know, it, it, it provides some authorities. So that's often the tricky part in the federal government is, is what do I have, who do I have the authority to work with and in what manner do I have the authority to work with them? And I think the Citizen Science Act really starts to lay out some of the, the capabilities we have to work with, you know, citizens, a, a.k.a. volunteers aka crowdsource data and, and bring it into to the federal government. So I think the government is recognizing those opportunities and, and really starting to open some doors there.
All right. So, so with all, all this new data that's available, you know, a lot more than we've ever had in the past, does this make a challenge for having uncertainty in our maps or anything that we publish or try and use? Or do you want to... No, not at all. No, no I'm kidding. Um, yeah, I mean, uncertainty is, is and particularly in the hazard risk space, there are compounding uncertainties. There's uncertainty in our source data. There's uncertainty in what we know about buildings, what we know about the extent and depth of a flood, what we know about how to calculate losses from that. And there's uncertainty in every element of that. And then when we tie it together, um, I know at FEMA, we're looking at ways to tackle this in two ways. Um, coming up with methods to scientifically and mathematically calculate uncertainty, which is incredibly challenging, but possible. And the paths for that differ hazard by hazard. Um, and then just communicating uncertainty from a public messaging perspective with disclaimers, um, with reporting ranges of values instead of absolute values, um, saying, saying what we know and saying what we don't know about ha hazard risk in an area, uh, providing guidance not just through raw data, but how do you interpret this data um, and, and how should you use this data and what other things you can look into. As uh, federal employees, which most of us are, I think uh, part of our responsibility is uh, to protect the United States uh, from claims uh, related to the work we do. Um, this uh, let me give you an anecdote. Uh, we're putting out uh, billions of dollars in, in, in uh, climate change related uh, funding. And uh, you, you do that, for example, by um, looking at your old uh, imagery data, determining where uh, your forests are, and uh, characterizing uh, the nature of your soils relative to carbon capture relative to carbon capture, or if you're looking at the emission side of the equation, trying to look at maps and derive uh, emission signatures for some of these uh, feedlots. And then uh, you're gonna accompany, accompany that with allocating uh, funds. Getting back to the uh, defending the United uh, States from uh, legal claims and uh, otherwise uh, challenges, um, it is imperative that we're able to tell uh, what confidence that we have on our interpretation of that pixel in terms of the cropland uh, that uh, is sitting on top of it, being uh, soybean corn or otherwise, rangeland, or having this X level of carbon capture. Now, um, how many of you uh, work with uh, research uh, or, or crazy scientist or yourself are a researcher crazy scientist? Well, I'm sorry for all of you. There's um, something inherent uh, in, uh, in GIS, and that's the layering of information. Uh, it, it is imperative that we track uh, the quality of that data. It's the most basic thing uh, that we have to do in order to utilize that data. And yes, uh, let's become friends uh, with, uh, with our researchers, our um, extra, extra aerial types, uh, statistician types, to understand you know, how to uh, add and multiply and and interpret um, the uh, the individual distributions of uncertainty attached to each data layer as we inject them into forecast models and complex uh, forecasts. It's possible. It's possible. We were talking about this just earlier with uh, one of my colleagues. When I was much younger in TV at five, and you know this story, well, maybe you're not, you're not old enough, but it, they were always the, the, the most difficult. The chaos theory started uh, in meteorology. This fellow, if you remember, the Lorentz equations from, from where first chaos was derived and studied. And these crazy people were so uh, audacious that they thought that they could uh, uh, track a, a hurricane and somehow tell the public to be careful. And they would talk at five o'clock, they would talk about the cone of equal likelihoods and uncertainty. They would describe that on TV. Today, they don't do that anymore. They, they show the track of the hurricane, they throw the old cone, you know, the uh, likely track, and everybody understands that. So for very complex systems, we've, we've, we've come up 
move with geospatial approaches to characterize and communicate uncertainty. It is a challenge, and I tell you, from where I sit, it's one of the biggest opportunities we have going forward. Uh, we need to do a better job as we integrate information uh, to get comfortable. If the meteorologist could do it, uh, I'm sure we can too. All right, well, thank you. So just to kind of to wrap up our panel, are there, there any last thoughts or anything you'd like to share? Any best practices, worst experiences? Anything around open source software you'd like to discuss? Okay. Oh, you got one? I've got one. I don't know I call this a worse experience. That's a little extreme. But not all open source software is free. And you, uh, even with open source software, we have to have an intellectual property review, look at the terms and conditions. Um, that's something we learn, you know, as part of our exploration into open source. I, I do have some bad experiences. I'll share my resume with you guys, and then you can read all about it. Um, I think the, the most positive experience we've had, uh, I was telling you about a diversification initiative, and that includes this meeting, is in getting to talk together and learning about the fact that Doug has already developed a lot of QGIS uh, training that is 508 compliant uh, and, and ready for us to load. So uh, some of the best experiences are always in getting together and, uh, and sure, sharing best practices. By the way, I was uh, really impressed uh, with the uh, mapping uh, uh, prompt engineering. Uh, if you didn't have time to go to that workshop, uh, look out uh, because it's already here. Uh, and I'm hearing it for the first time here at an open source uh, conference, uh, not, not from our commercial providers, which uh, makes me very proud that uh, some of our team, uh, several of our team, are here today. When I got on my resume, I'm not going to send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'd say from from our experience, actually, um, one one good story I guess we've got is we used open source software to do a lot of UAS and drone processing. And when we had some questions come down on the security side of some other software that we were using, we actually were had a much greater success with our security people with the open source software because we could take a look at the code. Uh, we could show them what was going on and how it was working. And so that actually um, allowed us to use that versus co software coming from other countries where it wasn't quite as open. So. So uh, with that, um, are there any questions from the audience or we can move on to our next topic? Start with you. Thank you. Um, my name's Greg, and I'm a technical lead on the new uh, project at the USGS. And we've had a uh, 3DHP hydrology. We have had interest from uh, various levels of government and potentially private sector about contributing their data sets, collecting it into our systems, spatial data systems. How do we keep their enthusiasm but temper their expectations? Because we're going to have to validate that data a lot more than our own contract to collect the data. What's that balance that? Why? How are you going to characterize it? Boy, so so they want to contribute their data sets, and we're just—it's just, it's just a, a, you're just trying to figure out how to how to allow them to contribute. Yeah, so it's just like they want to contribute live data, microwave, whatever else. Mm -hmm. They're using their own internet data structure. They want to contribute their own data structure, but the data is doing themselves, and they're not doing it. Boy, that, that that sounds like an interesting one. That's I don't know. Has the NSDI looked at how others can contribute data and how we pull things together with that? I, I, I guess so. So it's just a matter that they're they want to access into the federal system. Yeah, um, boy, making that available, that's, I mean, that, that's an ideal situation, I guess, if we can crack it, but I don't know that we have. <laughs> right, um, boy, yeah, I don't, 
I don't know that we've got a good good one, but that's a good thing to look at. Yeah. I mean, sorry. Yeah, I think I'd just add to, to David's comment. I mean, I think that is really something that as we look to, to how can we do better as a nation, that is sort of a perfect example, right? But it does illustrate the challenges of, you know, how do you integrate data from multiple sectors and then, you know, even to that term, right, is, is integrate the right word, you know, should we be validating it, can you use things like artificial intelligence to help do that work for you? Because I, I think just asking what are all, you know, what are our baseline assumptions there and, and are there opportunities to look at it differently? Because I think that's a problem we're all going to have to figure out how to deal with if we're taking data from non-traditional sources and integrating them. There are certainly, you know, the challenges you bring up. Yeah. Great. We have two more questions, so we're going to move along. But hopefully, you can chat after. <laughs> All right. Hi there, yeah, uh, well, uh, Matt Hansen, Element 84. Uh, I just wanted to talk briefly about standards. Uh, obviously, standards are super important. Um, <laughs> uh, obviously, standards are super important. However, the problem is that they're changing all the time. And more importantly is that the standards that are currently being developed now actually, in fact, aren't standards. Uh, things like cloud-optimized GeoTIFF, Stack, GeoParquet. Uh, these are things that have been developed by the community and then later are perhaps, maybe, maybe not actually adopted by um, a, a standards body. Um, I feel like it's really important that government embrace a lot of these things that we're seeing become de facto standards, such as stack, but how do you weigh that against the fact that like, there's actually no proper governing body behind those in some cases? I mean, I think that those are great questions and questions that I don't think we're we're ready to answer. We we have a group looking at kind of the the FGDC standards process and making some recommendations forward. But I think you know even the, the like the way OpenStreetMap does tagging versus you know content models versus you know like you mentioned Stack and OGC standards and things like that. I think you know the an, another example of I think we really need to be smart about how we undertake and do thing. You know is the way we have been doing standards the way we should be doing standards and how does that need to look moving forward and i think this community has a lot of opportunity to contribute to that conversation and help us understand you know what opportunities are out there and and what are the best ways we can move forward because this just gets harder and harder every day not just you know standards but the data integration question that was just asked i mean authoritative versus fit for use you know data pro i mean the number of people involved, entities involved, the proliferation of data, the, the integrators and all of these things, I mean, they're well beyond most of our capacity to deal with. So I think, you know, looking for help in, in all places that, that we can get it, I think, but, but re-looking standards and how we've been doing it and what's the, the way forward, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a great question and, and we're, we're working on it. I'm not gonna tell you we've, we've got it for sure, but. We have time for one more question, I think. Hi, Jackie Hazel, Bana Solutions. Um, I was wondering, in when you look at the ecosystem right now, and you look at the problem sets before you, right now, not two years from now, three years from now, 10 years from now, what you want the future to look like, but right now, what do you view as your biggest blocker or biggest hole in the ecosystem? <laughs> so uh, what, what, one minute. All right. So real quick. Uh, yes. What what is my biggest blocker as as I see things now? Um, I, actually, right now for me, I think one of the biggest blocker I have is the the procurement process, uh, particularly with like open source software, because right now we do not have the skill sets to do everything that we can do with other things, and uh, the development time and the expertise with that just requires a different data set or a different skill set, really. So that's 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm tempted to say resourcing, but I think that's kind of the, the easy way, <laughs> the easy way out. But you know, f figuring out what right looks like and how to sort of uh, organize and bring all of these groups with various interests and ideas and and bring it together. You know, national search comes to mind. This kind of data integration issue. So, some of these ways. You know, how, how do you how do you look at this process and provide the data? You know, I talked a lot about in my brief, but providing data and information in the easiest way it use to people that don't aren't data people and bring that to bear on the hardest problems we have I think that's probably the hardest thing Maggie Keeping us on time. say thanks to our panelists for all their great comments Hi, good afternoon. I'm Todd Bacchisto with Maxar. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here today to talk about uh, SpaceNet. We're gonna talk about SpaceNet 8 results um, and announce some more details for SpaceNet 9. So um, thanks to Eddie and for the planning committee for the opportunity to be here again this year. Uh, this has become um, one of, as, as Eddie alluded to, one of the recurring presentations. So we're really excited to uh, to share this year's updates for you, with you as well. Oh, first, uh, go ahead, go so as we're thinking about how SpaceNet evolves and any of the challenges that we have upcoming, we always try to take a step back um, and think about well, why we're doing what we're doing and how this can have an impact. One of the areas that we're focused right now um, is around the ability to improve data wrangling capabilities that can reduce sense making timeframes. We think that uh, artificial intelligence, specifically computer vision uh, capabilities, have a lot of potential to improve the alignment of multi-source data needed for downstream analytics. And this is particularly important um, in, uh, you know, whether open data or disaster response type scenarios when you can't necessarily predict what type of data you'll have in any given scenario. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with SpaceNet, um, or those maybe that have heard of it and still a brief background, uh, SpaceNet is a collaboration aimed to accelerate open source machine learning applied specifically for geospatial uses. Uh, this project was founded by Equitel Labs uh, Cosmic Works Group, um, as well as Maxar Technologies in August of 2016. Uh, leadership of the project was transitioned to Maxar in April of 2021, and today I'm very pleased to, to share our current um, partners that uh, collaborate with us on this project, including AWS, IEEE GRSS, TopCoder, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, the Open Geospatial Consortium, and most recently Umbra. The four pillars of SpaceNet have been consistent from the beginning. Uh, we saw a need to help provide labeled training data sets specifically for with satellite imagery. We run a series of prize challenges to help accelerate innovation in this space. The winning algorithms from the challenges are open sourced, and then the evaluation metrics used in those challenges are also published. The data sets uh, and the algorithms are, um, you know, the data sets are available before, during, and after the challenge, and then the uh, algorithms persist after as well. And there's this number of uh, publications that we publish um, around each challenge, including blog posts, as well as uh, research papers as well that are available for the broader community. From the beginning, we started pretty simple around um, mapping problems that we saw uh, that, you know, across the community, particularly around uh, foundational mapping. So we started with building footprints, we added geographic diversity, we added then roads and additional complexity as we progressed from SpaceNet 1 through 7. Today I'm going to talk more about SpaceNet 8 and then where we're going with SpaceNet 9. 
SpaceNet 8 was con concluded uh, in August of 2022. The objective was to identify flooded buildings and roads from pre and post event imagery. And there's a couple aspects that were novel. This was the first challenge that uh, we actually had m multiple uh, features that had to be identified. So not just buildings or roads, but buildings and roads. So that was unique. Uh, it was also the first challenge that took into account pre and post event imagery. Um, and then it also took into account attribution of those features in the post event imagery. So it was the first time that we had done that in a SpaceNet challenge. The competitors also had to handle realistic data set noise, including image alignment, uh, cloud cover, and missing regions that you typically find when you're working with this type of data. You can see some of the, the amount of data that was released as well as um, the prize amounts. To give you a sense of what some of the outputs look like, you can see our reference sample, um, as well as then the outputs from the top five uh, winners uh, across uh, a selected area, uh, as well as then so this is for buildings and roads and then the attribution. So the key takeaways from the challenge, we talked a little bit about this, um, the preliminary results of FedGeo Day last year, um, but this year we have some um, broader analysis to share. So about 1.5 improvement over the baseline, uh, and there was you know, some of the techniques that were used, there was pre-processing of the data, there was actually data used from prior challenges as well, uh, on ensembles of neural networks um, and rules-based post-processing to um, look at areas you know, that uh, wouldn't make sense for flooding. So happy to share a couple more details on SpaceNet 9, which is launching this winter. Our goal is to advance pre-processing techniques for computer vision. Uh, specifically, this challenge will focus on the alignment of tie points for optical uh, imagery and SAR data. You can see an example here, and it looks at uh, tie points such as uh, corners of buildings, uh, road intersections. Uh, and we think this is important uh, for additional downstream analytics for object identification. Here's the timeline um, that we're working on for SpaceNet 9. Our goal is to launch uh, this winter and then announce the, the winners in Q1 of 2024. So really excited about this uh, challenge is incorporating both uh, electro-optical and SAR data. And for more information, uh, please uh, come talk to me afterwards. Also, you can um, check out our spacenet.ai website as well as the open data repositories and our social media platforms. So thank you very much and appreciate the opportunity. <laughs>
and the other one is the global surface meteorology um, basic parameters. So something happened to the figures there, but that's also going back all the way from the 1980s. So a four plus decade worth of data sets put into the uh, hands of end users. What we're seeing here is an animation that's showing hourly data requests. The red dots are people in a uh, location on Earth and the arcs are pointing to a place on Earth for which they are requesting data. So this is just to exam exemplify that, okay, it has a mind of its own. <laughs> okay, um, so basically we're showing, you know, when whatever we're doing, that's the kind of impact. Every data that is being requested at an hourly base over here is a decision that somebody is making, and how are we supporting those decisions? How are we opening up these kind of, um, you know, accessibility questions? So I want to wa introduce you to some of our users over here. You know, this is Joe, and I'll be showing you some of these decisions that they're taking. Is wondering if I adopted green energy, um, can I save costs? Jill is wondering, I want to take my payload on a drone into the oceans. Is there enough sunlight to power my drone? Joshua wants to know that I implemented green technologies over seven solar site in facilities, and what is the performance? Margaret, a researcher, wants to know if I um, did an intervention of adding nitrogen fertilizer, how will it change the yield of corn? And then Ben, he wants to determine the optimal solar water pumping configuration for his customers. What does their world look like? This is a decision somebody is taking, and if they were to inform their decision with real-world observations, they're going to need to understand, first, what is the data that's available? Where is it available? How do I download it? Well, I need a data point for a location in the world, and turns out that Ben needs to process about nine terabytes of data for that one decision in one location. And then, of course, they need domain knowledge in terms of the science, the data formats, et cetera. So I just walked you through all the barriers that we have been working with end users to understand how can they use satellite data sets in their um, decisions? And we've been doing it for 25 years and identified that if we know the question they're asking, we can help them identify the exact source of data. And then we talked about data authority. In our science world, we call it characterizing the data quality. And if Ben, ben doesn't have the domain knowledge, then we need to provide that. So that completes everything that we can do to give data in everybody's hand, right? Data democratization here. Okay, now there's data for everyone. Is everyone able to access it? Well, beyond the understanding the needs of the data, it is absolutely important to make the data accessible, and that is part of the next phase that we have been handling with in our project where we transformed the data, we modernized our architecture to allow Ben to tease out 35 years of data from one location in the world in three seconds by optimizing the data sets and putting them into ZAR formats, which is time-optimized cloud meeting data, data formats. And then we distributed in several mechanisms. And so there is a user that needs the data in different uh, frameworks. So we've got different services so that people can adopt the data. For APIs, we also give out all kinds of codes, Jupyter notebooks, for people to just take the data and use it. We have a no-code access we have developed as a service, and so people can analyze, subset, download the data sets in different formats. These communities have specific needs for certain generating reports, and that is something that you can directly do from our websites and NASA strategic partnership with um, ESRI. Uh, we have all our data in uh, geo spatial feature services from, you know, you can download from ESRI Living GI Atlas and things. Lastly, we are working on a tool 
to give more power to the end users in terms of validating the data themselves, to look at what the uncertainty is when in the context of the decision they're making. So by adopting all these technologies, what we have um, identified that when we modernized, in the last five years, the data uptake has grown by tenfold. And we've got about seven million requests coming in per month. So this is just one product that I'm from NASA that's catering to one uh, basic community, but that's who we are power. So I hope I was give, able to give you an example of taking data from the launch to the last mile. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm Aaron Myers. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the environment for analysis of geolocated energy information. This is DOE's situational awareness platform for electric utility customer outages. Uh, currently, we collect data for about 140 million utility customers. That's not population, that's customers. That covers about 93% of the US uh, customers that's reported by EIA. Um, so the crux of this <clears throat> uh, capability is to provide that information, uh, but when we got the capability back from DOE in 2016, the question was how do we sustain this capability? It was written in a commercial, uh, commercial off-the-shelf platform, it had some flaws, how do we make it better? Uh, so we did an analysis, uh, should we move this to open source, should we keep the current architecture, should we um, develop a new commercial architecture around it? Looking at modernization, cloud deployments, authentication, um, kind of reducing our vendor tie-ins, looking at a lot of different things. Uh, so we did this trade-off analysis analysis and to probably to bury the lead with the title of that slide, we ended up with an open source solution. Why did we end up here? One, Oak Ridge, uh, the Geospatial Sciences and Human Security Division, we were at the time, it's probably 15 years now, we're developing off uh, 10 years of open source web application development. We knew we could do a lot with it. One of our kind of general principles is we found that getting to an end solution with commercial off the shelf might get you 80% faster, um, but we, that last 20% to get the full utilization that, the, that our users need uh, requires some really deep customization. So open source allowed us to really meet those user needs better. Uh, so we kind of landed on Docker for containerization, uh, Java and Python, and then for OGC services, so sharing the data out is one of the core principles that we have. Uh, we decided to use GeoServer. Um, so that's uh, built in within developing all of this off of a Postgres database. So now that we have a very modern, uh, sustainable architecture, now we can start to do more open science with it. One of the questions that we realized early on in this is not all counties are created equal. Big counties, little counties, power outages within these show differently. When you want to visualize consistently across the United States, we need to use percentage of percent of outages. There's not a national data set that has that, so we developed our own. Uh, so we created this, what we call modeled county customers. So looking at the EIA data, looking at data that we've collected in the past, we've actually been able to create this data set that lets you look at for a utility in a county, what is an expected number of customers? And we update this annually. We're also taking it, um, not all outages are bad. Uh, so when you're looking at energy justice question, this is one of the, the common themes is an outage is bad. And so we're starting to look at not just the number of outages, but what are the behaviors of utilities within counties? So from this histor history of data, we can now look at behaviors, trends, pattern analysis to understand how do these utilities behave across county boundaries, within county boundaries, uh, so we can start to maybe get at some of those energy justice questions. And then again, to support open science, one of the major things that we released just this past year was our whole historic archive of outage data. So we have data going back to November of 2014 through December of 2022. Um, in January of 24, we will release all of 2023's data. Um, that's the DOI that you can use to find the information. It's every 15 minutes for every utility in every county. Um, 
for that whole duration. Uh, we can also do ex extracts. If you want a particular event, that you want a subset of counties, uh, we can actually help you get to that information. Five minutes is not a lot of time. So luckily, I have a presentation in the main Phosphor-G uh, uh, conference um, at 1130 on Wednesday if you want to come hear about more um, or you can find me uh, walking around and, and talk to me about things. If you have any specific questions, uh, eagle-iono.gov uh, gets you to a monitored inbox that can uh, help answer those questions or make re data requests, get you that information that you need to, to utilize some of those capabilities. Thank you.